Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Dr. DeMarte, you are still under oath. Do you understand? Yes. You may continue with cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Dr. DeMarte. We, let's talk about some of the things that you had to say with fight versus flight, okay? Okay. Uh, you told us that when a person is in a fight versus flight episode, that it's a physiological response, right? There is a physiological response that occurs. And it's something, because it's a physiological response, that means that it has something to do with our bodies, right? Correct. And that's not something we can help? It's a, a response to fear, yes, it happens automatically. Okay, so we couldn't, we can't help what our body does, right? Correct. And um, when we talk about what our body does, it, the physiological response has an effect on our brains, right? Yes. And you're familiar with the part of the brain called the hippocampus? I am. And part of what the hippocampus does is deal we, dealing with short-term memories, right? I wouldn't use those words. Okay, what would you use? What the hippocampus does is it encodes information from the short-term memory to long-term memory. As I described it before, I think about it as a hallway. Okay. And so the short-term memories are in the hippocampus, and at some point they have to be encoded to the other parts of the brain to make form long-term memories, right? Correct. Okay. And so during this fight versus flight type of response, the hippocampus, there's, there's neurotransmitters that are released in our brains, right? Correct. And those neurotransmitters are things like adren adrenaline? Yes. Norepinephrine? Yes. And is it dopamine is the other one? Dopamine, cortisol is also released. Okay. And so all those things get released into our brain, right, when yes. we get in, go into a fight or flight situation. Yes. And what happens is, is it then floods the hippocampus, doesn't it? Yes. Those neurotransmitters. Yes. Right? And so when the hippocampus is flooded with those neurotransmitters, uh, it ultimately causes a problem with it uh, forming or keeping those short-term memories to be able to encode them to other parts of the brain, doesn't it? There's some interference. Some interference. Okay, meaning that there, it causes a problem with taking those short-term memories and encoding them into long-term memories, right? Yes, it can cause some problems. Right. So in other words, these short-term memories um, are not going to always get into our long-term memory, right? Not all of them. Okay. Uh, and sometimes not any of them during this period of time, right? That's not typical. It happens, doesn't it? That's not typical. I understand that you're saying it's not typical, but it happens, right? Anything's possible, but it's not probable. Okay. So um, what you're saying then is that when the hippocampus is flooded, sometimes it can have some of the memories and sometimes it may not. Usually there's some memory that's there. Okay. And there's some memory you're saying that then can be encoded for long-term memories. Yes despite all the neurotransmitters that have flooded the hippocampus. Right, it causes interference. Right, okay. So when a person goes into this fight or flight response, um, their, the higher brain activity starts to, uh, is affected, isn't it? Are you referring to executive functions? Yes. Yes. Okay, and, and that's on purpose, isn't it? That's the way we're created? Can you restate that question in a different way? No, I mean, it's, that's the way that the brain is meant to work, right? What's the way that the brain's meant to work? The executive functions are limited so that we can go into survival mode. So if I understand your question, you're saying in a fight or flight mode, the reason why they go into a limited ability is so that we can survive. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I mean, it goes to survival. It helps us survive, right? So we can, so that basically we go into a specific type of mode so that that way the only focus of the body and the brain is to survive. Yes, that is correct. Okay. And just because some of the executive functions of our brains are shut down, it doesn't make a person into a walking idiot, right? That's correct. Uh, they're able to function, aren't they? Depends on how you're defining function. Well, they're able to continue walking around. Yes, gross motor movement is continued to be seen. All right. And they're able to defend themselves, aren't they? And what do you mean by defend themselves? Survive. They're able to survive if it's successful. Yes. They're able to do that, right? If it's successful. Well, they're able to attempt to survive, right? Attempt to survive, yes. Okay. And by attempting to survive, they're able to attempt to defend themselves. Objection, yes.
Now, when we go into this fight or flight mode, right? The whole point is to survive. That's correct. Okay. And so when that means that the ability that we still as humans have the ability to defend ourselves, right? If that's the mechanism that's being used, there's fight or flight. Right. So if, if flight isn't going to work and the person has to stay and fight, that's the point of this whole mode within our brains to be able to attempt to defend ourselves, right? What typically happens is that they engage in either fight or flight. Right. I know that. But what I'm saying is, is that when we're talking about if we're not going to flight, if there's no flight, then we're talking about fight. So if we're talking about fight, that means that our brains are intended so that we can attempt to defend ourselves, right? Yes. Okay. When the hippocampus gets flooded with these neurotransmitters, um, at some point, these neurotransmitters are going to recede from the brain and kind of go, to, go away after a while, right? Go back to normal levels. Yes. And when that happens, the hippocampus, you're not telling us that the hippocampus is destroyed, right? When they go back to normal? Yeah, once the neurotransmitters kind of recede and your brain starts to function in a normal sense again, the hippocampus is generally still intact, right? What I explained before was that if there's prolonged exposure, that you can see damage. But typically when, the, when it does drop to normative levels, you don't see continued damage. Okay. So... In, on direct, you talked about uh, seeing atrophy, right? Yes. And so you're saying that when the hippocampus is uh, under prolonged levels of these neurotransmitters, then you start to see atrophy? That it's possible to see atrophy. And is that something that happens a lot? No. Okay. And uh, when the hippocampus atrophies, that's when people tend to have long-term memory problems, right? That's when they have difficulty through the encoding process, taking new information and encoding it into long-term memory. All right. And when you talk about atrophy, that's something that we see in, in diseases like, um, um, well, diseases that cause memory issues, like Alzheimer's, right? That's one area. Okay. And with atrophy, though, I know that you, you noted on direct that you didn't notice any type of atrophy issues with Miss Arias's hippocampus, right? You didn't see any evidence of that? I certainly did not examine her hippocampus. I don't have the ability to do that. What I said was that I don't, did not see any continued memory problems that would be suggestive of okay. an atrophied hi hippocampus. All right, so you're not suggesting that her hippocampus was somehow atrophied, right? Right, I, I did not examine okay. her hippocampus. And when the hippocampus is flooded with these neurotransmitters, and these short-term memories then aren't encoded into the long-term memory, that's not something that these memories are ever going to come back, right? Because they were never encoded. There may be some memories that will never come back. I'm speaking specifically of memories, short-term memories, that never get encoded to long-term memories. So if they're never encoded, there's nothing there to, for the person to retrieve. Don't you agree? I understood your question. Do you agree with that? Some then? of those memories. Yes, I agree with that. You're saying some of those memories. What yes. I'm asking, though, is that... If we have a group of memories, for the sake of argument, let's label them A, B, and C. A, B, and C get into the hippocampus as short-term memories. The hippocampus is then flooded with neurotransmitters. A, B, and C memories don't get encoded to the brain as long-term memories. Right? Are you understanding so far? I think you're using different language than I am. You're using an all or nothing, and I'm saying that there's interference that occurs. I'm not using all or nothing. I'm specifically speaking of, of specific memories labeling them A, B, and C. If they are not encoded into long-term memory, we're not going to ever get the memories of A, B, and C back, right? Right, if those memories were not encoded, correct. Okay, all right. And you talked about uh, Miss Arias deleting photos, right? Yes. But you certainly didn't watch the testimony in this trial, right? No. And... So you don't have any information about who deleted these photos, right? Right. Well, it was in the police records. You think it was in the police records that Miss Arias deleted the photos? Well, that there was photos that were deleted. Right. But on direct, you talked about the photos that were deleted by Miss Arias. I'm asking you, where did that information come from? What I just highlighted that uh, on the police records that there were photos that were deleted. Yes, but in the police records, it doesn't say that Miss Arias deleted the photos, does it? Her specifically, 
I don't recall. Okay. So on direct, then you're assuming that Ms. Arias deleted the photos? Yes. Okay. So it's just an assumption on your part? Based on the evidence that I had, the records that I had. But there are no records that actually say she deleted the photos? Just that the photos were deleted. Okay. And you don't know when these photos were deleted, right? They were deleted when they were found. Right. But you don't know if they were deleted before the attack or after Mr. Alexander attacks her. Objection. Um, those facts are not in evidence, i.e. Mr. Alexander attacked her. Those facts are in evidence. As to that objection, rephrase. You don't know when these photos were deleted, whether it was before Mr. Alexander jumped out of the shower at Miss Arias, right? Objection. It's in fact not it, it was testified to. Overall, do me answer. Can you ask that again? Sure. You don't know if these photos were deleted before Mr. Alexander got out of the shower and went after Miss Arias, right? Again, objection. You don't know if he went after her. That's her testimony. May continue. Uh, Dr. DeMarte, what I'm trying to ask you is whether or not you have any knowledge that these photos that were deleted, if they were deleted before Mr. Alexander came out of the shower and went after Ms. Arias. Objection. Ladies and gentlemen, you are directed to recall the evidence you heard during this trial. May continue. According to the records, the photos that were deleted were those of him in the shower, and that would suggest that it was after the killing. Okay. And there was also other photos on there as well, too? I'm aware of that. Okay. And the photos of take it, that Mr. Alexander took of Miss Arias, right? Yes. And those photos were taken earlier in the day? Yes. And do you, you don't have any knowledge as to when those photos de were deleted, right? That's correct. And you don't have any knowledge as to how many total photos were taken, right? That's correct. So you don't know which ones might have been taken and deleted and some were kept, right? Say that again. You don't know which photos would it, might have been deleted before Mr. Alexander came out of the shower? Uh, or whether or not they were deleted afterwards, um, which ones were deleted, and then some might have been deleted and then retaken, more taken. Well, based on time, the photos of him in the shower were the last photos, and I know those were deleted. The deleted upon uh, getting the camera, right? When police received the camera? Yes. And the photos... Um, you're aware that, that Miss Arias is a photographer, right? Yes. And she liked to take photos? Yes. And she did it quite a bit, didn't yes. she? In fact, she's taken photos for weddings? Yes, I heard her say that. You heard her say that? In the uh, police uh, interrogation. Okay. And so then, so you know then that she is familiar with cameras, right? Yes. And would be familiar with digital cameras? Presumably. Okay. So somebody who's familiar with these things wouldn't be such a difficult thing to delete photos if they're familiar with the item, right? Sustained. Okay. So let's... You were asked questions about organization and planning, right? Correct. And uh, you were asked these questions talking about after... Mr. Alexander was killed, right? Correct. 
you talked about the fact that the scene seemed to be somewhat cleaned up. There was some cleaning? According to the police records. All right. And you saw the photos, didn't you? Yes. Uh, and you talked about the fact that... Um, that uh, there was no weapon at the scene, right? Found? Correct. Okay. But in the photos, you can see that whatever cleaning that may or may not have been done, the person didn't do a good job, right? Object to lack of information, rule 702, 703. It doesn't take an extra. Approved. Approved. All right, so you're familiar with the, with the photos taken of the scene, right? Yes. And in seeing those photos of the scene, you can tell that the scene certainly wasn't cleaned completely, was it? It was not cleaned completely. Okay. And there was a lot of uh, evidence or blood left at the scene, wasn't there? The photos that I saw was that there was a lot of blood on the carpet. Mm -hmm. I saw that, and I saw that there was some blood on the sink. And I saw that there was very little blood surrounding Mr. Alexander. In the shower? In the shower. Okay. Uh, but there was blood on the bathroom floor and things of that nature, right? The photos that I saw were, again, the sink and the carpet. Okay. So you didn't see all the photos then? I don't, I don't know how to answer that question because I don't know if there's others. Okay. So you don't know if you saw them all is what you're saying? I just told you the ones I saw. Okay. So you saw three? Um, I saw several of Mr. Alexander. Okay. All right. And when we're talking about um, executive function versus lower function, when we're talking about the brain, right? When we're talking about being in fight or flight mode. Okay? Okay. We, we talk about, we talk about um, that the executive function such shuts down. Yes. Right? So when the executive function shuts down, you already told me that the person doesn't mean that the person is like a walking idiot, right? They're able to have gross motor skills. That's correct. Okay. And that would uh, mean somebody who is familiar with doing certain things would be able to do them still, right? If it's something that they do frequently, yes. Okay. And so, uh, and so when we're talking then about somebody who's familiar with using a camera, deleting photos uh, would be something, if they do that frequently, then that would be something that they would be able to do, right? That's different from choosing photos to delete which photos to delete. Well, okay, so now, well, what if they were all deleted? If they're familiar with that camera, then it's possible that it would be considered a gross motor movement. Okay. And then that would be something that someone can do in fight or flight, right? If they, going back to deleting every photo on there? Yes. It's possible. Okay. And in talking about the organization and, and the planning that supposedly went on after Mr. Alexander had been killed, you're aware that the camera with all of the photos were actually found in the house in the washer, right? Yes. 
And the camera that had all these photos of Miss Arias and, and Mr. Alexander on it was uh, intact in the washer, wasn't it? My understanding is that the photos were deleted and that there, it, it gave the appearance that it had gone through a cycle. So I don't, if, I don't know if it was intact. Well, intact meaning that the camera was still in one piece, right? After being ran through the washing machine? Well, you don't know that it was run through the washing machine, do you? I, I, I don't know definitively. No, you don't. So what I'm asking you is if the camera itself was in one piece. Do you know this or no? I believe so. Okay. And the camera had in it, you're aware that it had the SD card, right? Would that be the card that holds the, the memory card? Yes, the memory card. Yes. And the memory card, you're aware, wasn't destroyed in any way, was it? I don't know if it was destroyed. Okay. And so you didn't, you didn't follow up to find out if these <coughs> photos, uh, if the SD card or the memory card, if it was intact or not? You don't have any knowledge about that? I just know they were deleted. Okay. I don't know if it was destroyed. Okay. So in the when you reviewed the police report, that fact wasn't important you for you to remember? <coughs> Was it not important? I didn't see that in there, that it was destroyed or not. Okay, so you didn't see in the police report then that the SD card was pulled out of the camera and it was used by the police to pull these photographs off? I knew that they had to get it off somehow, but I, I'm not knowledgeable about cameras in particular and how that process would work. Okay, but on direct, it was important to you to, to note that the bathroom had been, had poured water, that someone had poured water on the floor, attempted to clean, right? That was important to you? That was important to me. And that was something that you retained in your memory when reading the police reports, right? Right. Okay, but it's not important to you when you're talking about organization and planning to note that this camera that has all the evidence of Miss Arias being at the scene during this, during this situation, that the camera was left in a washer completely intact with the SD card with all the pictures on it. Right. The important part that stood out for me of that was that it was deleted. Okay. And you didn't find that uh, the fact that the camera was strangely left in a washer, you didn't find that strange then? Strange? Yes. That a camera would be in a washer? M my understanding of the records, like I highlighted earlier, was that it had been through a cycle. That you there was some evidence that it had been... Put through a cycle. So did I find that strange? I... Well, let me ask you this. So you think that there's some evidence that the camera went through a cycle? That was my understanding. From reading the police reports? That's, I believe so. That was my understanding, that it was damaged <coughs> by, or tried to be damaged in some way by putting, being put through a cycle. Okay. So what I guess what, what I'm trying to ask you is, is the point that you find it important that there's cleanup in the bathroom, right? Yes. Okay. But yet you don't find it important as to someone's ability to organize or plan when they leave then behind the most important piece of evidence, which is the evidence that she was there. You don't find that important. Yeah, yeah. Rule 702, most important piece of evidence. Do you find it important? What part? That she left the camera behind that has all the evidence of her being there. Did that in any way figure into your opinion with regard to this organization and planning afterwards? Yes, the fact that it was deleted. So just the fact that it was deleted, but the fact that she left it there at the scene was not important? The fact that it, it was my understanding that it was put through a cycle I'm was asking, important, yes, that it was left behind and put through a cycle. Okay, so the fact that it was... I'm not talking about the cycle. The fact okay. that the camera itself, with all the evidence on it and able to get by forensic people... That was not important to you? No, it's important. So you considered that then in this organization and planning, that all the evidence was left behind? Yes, I would consider that part of organization and planning. Leaving evidence behind for someone to find? And then putting it through a cycle. Leaving evidence, what I'm asking you, Dr. DeMarte, is so then you agree with me that, this, that leaving evidence behind at a scene, at a crime scene, you find that to be evidence of organization? Yes, the way it was done, yes. Okay, all right. Because when somebody leaves evidence of themselves being, being there at a crime scene, that's evidence of organization to you, right? Because there was deleting that occurred. Okay, all right. You talked about the pattern of memory uh, getting worse instead of better. Do you remember that? I With talked about undirect. 
I talked about the pattern of memory getting better. Oh, you're right, I'm sorry, getting better instead of worse or staying the same, right? In typical traumatic memories, is that what you're referring to? No, no, let me start over. Okay, okay when, you were asking, when you were answering questions by Mr. Martinez, yes. you talked about uh, Jody's memory, right? Yes. And when you talked about her memory, you said that it seemed to be getting worse rather than better, that she wasn't recalling any new memories. Instead, it seemed to be getting worse for you. That's correct. Okay. Uh, and, that, and you based that opinion on the fact that because you believe that she told Dr. Samuels that she got rid of the weapons. That's what you said, right? Yes, that's what he had in his report. Okay. Well, what he actually had in his report was that she, was, that she threw the gun away, right? That's what she had. That's what he had. That she threw the, the gun away. Got rid of the gun. And then changed her clothing. Right. Okay. So he didn't talk about weapons in plural, did he? I'd have to reference his uh, report to be specific about that. Okay. And she doesn't have a specific memory as to where the knife went, right? She told me that she had a vague memory. The vague memory of putting it in a dishwasher, right? That's correct. But she also told you that she doesn't know if that's a real memory or if that's something that she's remembering from before, like some other time, right? That's how she described it. Okay. And to you, it was important that uh, this information was told to Dr. Samuels, you think, before she spoke to you, right? Yes. And so, in other words, you think that she had more information uh, before she, when she spoke to Dr. Samuels and less information when she talked to you? Yes. Okay. And we've been over this, I think, ad nauseum, but you spent about 12 and a half hours with Miss Arias, right? That's correct. And you're aware, do you know how much time Dr. Samuels spent with her? I know he went back and saw her several times. I don't know the exact number of hours. Okay. Well, you know he spent about 25 to 30 hours with her. Does that sound about right? I just said that I don't know. Okay, so you don't have any idea? I know that he saw her several times. That's all oh. I know. All right. Well, you know that he saw her several times, and he went to see her after you saw her, right? The date on his report the, where it says conclusion of the evaluation was prior to when I saw her. Okay. So you're not aware of the fact that he went to see her after that report to talk about new information that was received? Mm -hmm. That foundation, new information. Okay. Can you answer? The report that I had, that's where the information was already included in. When um, I did see that he added an addendum later on, but it was a separate piece of paper. What I'm referring to was the actual report where he put the conclusion date on there, which was prior to when I saw him. Okay, so you're not talking about the addendum then? No, I'm not talking about the addendum. Okay, because there was an addendum, you know that he went back to see her again, right? Yes. And you'd agree that he spent more time talking to Miss Arias than you did, right? According to the hours that you just gave me, if those are accurate, then the answer would be yes. All right. And so uh, it's certainly conceivable, given the amount of time that he spent with her versus the time that you spent with her, she might have given him more information, right? She and had long, is that right? If they spent more hours together, then, then yes, she yes. would have collected more information. You also testified that you found it unbelievable that uh, when Jody is driving towards Hoover Dam and she realizes that she has blood on her hands. Do you remember talking about that? I do remember talking about that. Okay, and you said that you found it unbelievable that when she saw that she had blood on her hands, she knew something bad had happened, right? No, that's not what I said. Well, but you and she's told you that, right? That she knew something bad had happened? That she had killed him. Right, and, and knowing that something bad had happened, right? That would fall under the category of something bad. Okay, and that based on... Uh, you find it to be unbelievable that she would not know that she, that she would make that statement that um, that she thought she had killed him, right? You find that to be unbelievable. Uh, per her report that she had no memory of what happened, I find that unbelievable. Okay. But also per her same report that she told you, the, her last memories were after she shot him, right? Yes. So she remembers shooting him. Shooting Mr. Alexander, right? Yes. And she remembers him coming after her as she's shooting, right? Yes. And she remembers that after she shoots him, he falls on top of her, right? Yes. And she remembers that she had to roll away from him, right? Yes. And she remembers that she had to run down the hall. Yes. And that she remembers that she's running away from him. Yes. And she remembers the last thing that he tells her is, I'm going to fucking kill you, bitch, right? As he was running after her. Yes. Yes. Okay, so given all the things that she does remember up until that point, 
It's not a huge leap to think that something bad had happened when blood is on her hands, right? You're using different words now. No, I'm just asking you, generally speaking. It's not a huge leap to assume that something bad happened when she sees bloods on her hand. It's what? a huge, it, I disagree. So you think that that's not a logical leap then? I agree that that's not a logical leap. Okay, so, <laughs> all right. So it's not logical then to assume that something bad had happened when you know that you just shot somebody and you know he was coming after you and you know that you were terrified and then hours later you see blood on your hands. You're using the word something bad that happened and I'm referring to the fact that she said, I knew I killed him. I know, but I'm not talking about that right now. I'm just asking you the simple question of whether or not it's a logical leap for someone to assume something bad happened after we have all this, this, these facts going on. If you're... Approach. May I continue? All right, Dr. Dermate, let, I just, I want to make sure that I'm clear with this question, okay? okay. All right. So I'm not speaking about anything that Ms. Arias told you, okay? Do you understand that? So it's hypothetical? Sure. Let's do it as a hypothetical if that helps, okay? Okay. Okay. So for someone to look down at their hands and see blood on them, okay, knowing that just before that, they were in a situation where they had to shoot somebody, that somebody was coming after them, and that that somebody was threatening their life, okay? In that situation, it's not a huge leap, is it, for that person to say something bad might have happened? Sure, looking at that broad category that's not related to this case, yes, I could see that. So you that can agree with not, me on that. That then. it wouldn't be a broad leap to see blood and say something bad happened. Okay, so you can agree with me on that then, right? Yes. Okay, so now let's take it one step further. <sighs> Knowing that Miss Arias had to just, was just in a situation where she had to shoot Mr. Alexander, where he fell on top of her, where he came after her, where she was terrified and she was fearful for her own life, and then seeing blood on her hands, Understanding that it's not her blood, you think that that's not really a huge leap, is it, to think that she might have killed him? Judge, not really it's her own blood. Sustained. Whether it's her own blood or not, it's not a huge leap, is it, to say that I might have killed him, knowing that everything that just happened, everything that she remembers about just happening. As I stated before, it is a huge leap. Okay, and that's a huge leap for you. That's what your personal opinion, isn't it? That is my opinion. Okay, it's your personal opinion, right? It's my opinion as a psychologist. <laughs> so I understand it's your opinion as a psychologist, but, but it's an opinion that you yourself made, right? I'm a psychologist, and I made that opinion based on my knowledge of memory and how memory works. Okay. And so because it's you as a person making this, making this opinion, based on even being a psychologist, it's still a subjective opinion, isn't it? And when you use the word subjective, what do you mean by that? I mean that it's an opinion based on what your own thoughts are and your own experiences. And on my education and understanding of how memory works. So you agree with me then that it's subjective? I would say it's based on my understanding of how memory works. So it's not subjective? Are you saying it's objective? I think that's an objective piece of data that was given to me. I'm not talking about the data. I'm talking about your opinion as to whether or not this is a huge leap or not. You, you can't agree with me that that's subjective? I think there's a, enough objective data to suggest that that couldn't have happened. I'm not talking about the data. I'm talking about your opinion, your opinion alone. When we talk about your opinion, can you not agree with me that that's a subjective 
opinion. Yes, it's my opinion based on information that I know about memory. Yes, so it's subjective then. If, that, if those are the words that you're using, then yes. Yes, you agree. Yes, those are the words that you're using. Okay, well, I, I know I'm using them, but I'm asking you if you're agreeing with me. It that's sounds like that's what you believe the definition to be, so yes, that's... Then you agree with me? Yes. Okay. You talked about another report from Dr. Uh, Dr. Karp. Yes. And you're aware in that report, Dr. Karp conducted several tests with Ms. Arias, right? Yes. And those tests included the TSI? Yes. And that's the trauma symptom inventory? Correct. And that's the test that measures trauma, right? And general um, emotional distress. OK. Uh, and she also did the Beck depression inventory? Yes. And what is that? It's um, a self-report measure that measures depression. OK. And um, another inventory taken from pattern changing for abused women? Yes. Okay. And do you know what that is? I believe that was a measure of um, uh, background exposure to violence. Okay. And the WALMYR assessment scales, the partner abuse scale, do you know what that is? Yes. What's that? It's, again, a self-report measure of exposure to domestic violence. Okay. And there's two of those, right? One for physical and one for non-physical abuse. That's correct. Okay, and both of those were given, right? That's correct. And when you say self-report, that means that these that there are a bunch of questions in these reports, right? Yes. And the person is meant to answer these questions. Yes. And when these questions are posed, they're posed in a way that uh, whether the, whether or not the person believes it to be abuse, they're just simply asked factual questions, factual situations, right? What person were you referring to? The person who's answering these questions. So ask that question again. Okay. So when the assessment scales, the partner abuse scales, when those, when those um, tools are used, they're asking the person who's using it, and let's just talk about Jody. When they're asking Jody, uh, they're just questions that she's answering, right? She's answering questions. Okay. And those questions uh, are asking her specific about specific situations, right? Yes. And then the idea is, is that of these, of these assessments is that from, from seeing those answers to these assessments, the psychologist makes a decision as to whether or not there is abuse, right? Yes. It's not Ms. Arias who's making that determination, right? Correct. It's based on her response. Right. And you didn't give any of these assessments, right? That's correct. And during this time, uh, and the, you would agree that these assessments are very detailed questions? Yes. And so, and in these questions, they're not asking Miss Arias whether or not she believes the situations to be abusive, right? They're just asking her for factual situations. Correct. And when you spoke to Miss Arias, you talked to her, you specifically asked her what she thought was abusive, right? What do you mean by that? Well, you asked her about any physical incidents, right? I, yes. Okay. And when you talk about that, you sp were specifically referencing what she thought to be physically abusive, right? And I gave some examples to help her understand it. Okay. And, but that was your, that was your direct questions to her, right? What was? The question, uh, you're specifically asking her, tell me what, what you believe to be abusive. Tell me what he did that you think is abusive, right? Yes. And I think yesterday we established that you agree that battered women often minimize details, don't they? They do. Now, ultimately, you said your opinion was that Ms. Arias has borderline personality disorder? Correct. And borderline personality disorder is something that uh, is, if, if you're going to diagnose that, you need to see evidence of that from a very young age, right? 
You need to see evidence of that sometime before the age of 18. Okay. And so, uh, so would it be enough if you see the evidence at age 17 and nothing before that? You usually see a pattern, as I described before, the pattern of personality tends to start developing relatively young, and you may see an escalation of those symptoms over time. Okay, so when you say relatively young, what do you mean? Again, personality starts developing in the toddler years and starts to um, become more solidified as they get older. Okay, and so when you're looking for patterns with relation to borderline personality, you would expect to see them, you said sometime before 18, but really wouldn't you expect to see them long before 18? Usually start seeing, um, at the point when they start becoming maladaptive is older than that, usually start to see it more in their teenage years. Okay, and, uh, and what you want to see is you want to see a pattern of it, right? Not just one incident. That's correct. And you'd agree that if the person has suffered from a trauma, that when you look at that trauma, you need to see the evidence of any type of borderline traits before the trauma, right? When you're talking about trauma in adulthood, or you're talking about trauma in childhood? I'm talking, let's say trauma in adult. Okay. So, and let's speak about Miss Arias. So we know, let's let, assume for a second with me that she was trauma, that she had a traumatic event on June 4th, okay? Okay. And assume for me that that was traumatic for her, okay? Okay. And assume for me that abuse, the abusive, long-standing abusive and emotional uh, abuse that she suffered was traumatic for her as well, okay? Okay. And so if a person who you are diagnosing with borderline personality uh, has a traumatic event or traumatic events, you want to see evidence of borderline prior to the traumatic event. That would be correct. And that's what the DSM-4 tells you, doesn't it? Yes. And in fact, do you want to see clear evidence of this pattern before any traumatic events? Yes. Right? Okay. All right, so on direct, you talked about the different criteria for borderline, right? Yes. And the first criteria is frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment, right? Yes. And there is a word in there, frantic, right? Yes. So it's not just somebody who doesn't want to break up with their boyfriend. There's a lot more than that, right, when we're talking frantic? Yes. Uh, and you talked about that it, there's a strong desire to be attached to people, right? Yes. And as evidence for you, for borderline personality, for Jody, you find the fact that she moved to Mesa after she and Mr. Alexander broke up. You find that to be evidence. One piece of evidence. Okay. A data point, right? Yes. And so, uh, but you're aware that she moved to Mesa. Uh, well, first of all, you're aware that this is, happens in July of 2007, right? Yes. Okay. And you talk about this happening after she and Mr. Alexander broke up, right? Yes. But you're aware that, that they never actually stopped talking to each other, right? They did not stop talking to each other. And in fact, Mr. Alexander continued his relationship with her after she broke up with him. You know this, right? Continued his sexual relationship with her. Well, he continued talking to her too, didn't he? Yes, he continued talking to her. And he continued uh, saying really nice things to her, didn't he? He sometimes did say nice things to her, yes. Yes, and he continued inviting her over his house. I saw a couple instances where he invited her, yes. Well, you know that they traveled together just a few months after she moved to Mesa, right? I'm aware that they did travel together. Okay. And uh, you talk about her overstepping boundaries because she checked his text messages? Yes. Right? Um, and... She told you that she did that because she believed he was cheating on her, right? Yes. And in fact, she confirmed that by looking at his text messages. Yes. And then you also um, think that uh, that she looked at his Facebook as well. Numerous times. Okay. And you're aware that they actually traded passwords, right? Well, that's what I saw that she had said in her diary, and that mm -hmm. was in opposition to a conversation that they had in 
some written form. I don't know if it was instant messaging or text. Well, this conversation that you're referring to, when did it happen? I believe that conversation was in May. Right. So after she moved away from him, right? That would be the time frame after. Right. And the conversation that you're referring to is when they both stopped, uh, that they both changed their passwords so neither one of them can look at each other's Facebooks anymore, right? Or MySpace. I don't know when that happened, but what I do know is that he indicated that she continued to look at her, his Facebook account without his authorization. And you think that, and that's coming directly from Mr. Alexander's mouth? Yes. Well, not directly from his mouth. It's coming from written form. Written form, but something that he's supposedly typing, right? Not supposedly. I saw it. Yes. Okay. Well, you weren't there when he typed it, is what I'm saying. Yes, I was not there. Okay. And so all of these things that you talk about with regard to the first criteria all have to do with Mr. Alexander, don't they? No, there's other instances. Well, not that you gave us on direct, right? The things that you talked about on direct were talking about just Mr. Alexander, the I'd timeline when she was dating him or in a relationship with him. I'd be happy to provide other examples if you'd like me to. No, I'm not asking you for that. I'm asking you about the when on direct, when the prosecutor was asking you for examples of why you believe she fit into the first criteria, the only examples that you gave us all had to do with Mr. Alexander, right? I don't recall exactly if that's all the examples I gave because I have several other examples. Okay, so you don't remember that the only examples you gave was had to do with Mr. Alexander? It sounds like that's the case if that's what you're telling me, but that's not what I, I don't remember if that's the case. Okay. I have numerous other examples if you'd like me to give them to you. No, no, I just want to talk about what, what you okay. talked to the prosecutor about. Okay. Um, the second one, the second one is a pattern, a pattern of unstable and intense interpersonal relationships, right? Yes. Well, and actually, I'm sorry. Let me, um, let me go back to the efforts to avoid real and imagined abandonment for a second. Uh, you understand that uh, Miss Arias actually moved out of her home when she was a teenager, right? She left her parents? Yes. And she stayed with a boyfriend at the time? Yes. You know that she had several jobs during that time, right? She, as a teenager into her adulthood, she was always working, wasn't she? At many different jobs, yes. Okay. Well, how many different jobs when you say many? Um, she had told me that she had worked for several years in her father's restaurant and that yeah. she had also had it at, the, at a minimum of 10 different restaurant jobs. She and told you that she had 10 different restaurant that she had, jobs? Yes, I believe that's the case. I can reference my notes if that would be helpful. Sure, if you have them. Sure. It's just my whole notes that have been disclosed already. Okay. Just so you know. Do you want me to mark the whole thing or did you want to pull it? Sure, you can mark the whole thing and then I can have that back. Thank you. I was correct in what I said. That she told you 10 jobs? At a minimum, yes. Okay. And Amongst she, many other jobs. And did, so she had 10 restaurant jobs and more than that as well? 10, I'm referring to restaurant jobs, yes. Okay. And and more as well, of different types of jobs. Different types of jobs be, 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 besides restaurant jobs? That's correct. What were these? She indicated that one was being a spa receptionist. Okay. She also indicated that um, at one point she was a caretaker, I believe, of a child. Okay. When was that? Let me see if I could find that in my sure. notes. Sure. And can you tell us the, what the number is? I'm sorry, I didn't ask you. The, on the green tag for your notes? On the back. Six three zero. Okay, so you're referring to Exhibit six three zero. November two thousand seven to January of two thousand eight. She was a caretaker for a young boy. Okay, all right. So, so for a year she was a caretaker for this little boy. Um, it doesn't appear that that's a year. What'd you say? Two thousand November two thousand seven to January of two thousand eight. Oh, okay. All right. So. 
Uh, and when you talk about this effort of uh, frantic effort to avoid real or imagined abandonment, you talk about it as being terrifying to be separated, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, and all right. And the second, uh, the second criteria you have is a pattern of unstable and intense interpersonal relationships, right? Correct. And you, you characterize that as a strong tendency to go from boyfriend to boyfriend, right? For Miss Arias. I characterize that. Are you talking about the symptom in general or how it specifically applies to her? How it applies to her. That was one example. Okay. So the fact that she had four boyfriends from the time that she was 14 up until now, that you characterize as going from boyfriend to boyfriend? That was also coming from uh, her childhood friend who also made that exact same comment. So that in combination to having these boyfriends back to back. Uh, her childhood friend who, who made a comment that she went from boyfriend to boyfriend? Yes. Okay. And her childhood friend isn't a psychologist like you, right? No, I was just highlighting another data point. Okay. So it's, this is something you're talking in a psychological, clinical evaluation type way, right? Right. Okay. And so you, as a psychologist, consider her going from boyfriend to boyfriend because she had four boyfriends from the time she was 14. Uh, back to back. Back to back, mm -hmm. okay. So the fact that she was uh, with, let's say, Mr. Brewer for a total of four years, that is, doesn't characterize any stability for you? Oh, that shows stability. Okay, and the fact that she was missed with Mr. McCartney for two years, that would show stability as well, right? That shows stability. And the... The third one you talk about, the third criteria being identity disturbance, right? Yes. And that's markedly and persistently unstable self-image, right? Self-concept, yes. Self-image. Self-image. Okay. And for that, your evidence was the fact that she joined the Mormon church quickly, right? That was one. That was one of your data points that you used. Yes. Uh, and you're aware that when she joined the Mormon church, it was just two months after she met Mr. Alexander, right? Yes. So again, we're talking about a time period of Mr. Alexander. Yes. And it was, you're aware that after she met Mr. Alexander, within a week, he was sending Mormon missionaries to her house, right? No. Oh, you didn't know that? No. Oh, okay. And then, then did you not know that these Mormon missionaries came to her house once a week until she converted? No. You weren't aware of that? No. You didn't get that in your 12 hours? I didn't get that in my 12 hours. Okay. And The fifth one you talked about as recurrent suicidal behavior, gestures, or threats, right? Correct. And then also includes self-mutilating behavior. Correct. All right. And there's no self-mutilating behavior, right? None that I'm aware of. And you know of no actual threats she ever made to anybody to commit suicide, right? Prior to this traumatic event? Let's say prior to June 4th. I need a second to think about that. Sure. When you say actual threats, there was, um, I would consider this a threat. There were um, comments in her diary. And at that, that time, those comments in her diary, she didn't actually give a plan that she was going to kill herself, right? A specific plan, no. Okay. So what she was actually, any references to her diary prior to this, to meeting Mr. Alexander, we're talking about that she had low self-image, right? That it wasn't worth her being alive, something to that effect. You're attaching a low self-image with suicide. I wouldn't do that. I would say that there were numerous comments um, beginning as early as 1995 of repeated suicidal, mention of suicide and desire to commit suicide. Okay, but that, that's my question, though. When you're talking about these suicide, she's not giving an actual plan in her journal, right? She's not saying, I'm going to go home and take 30 pills so I can die tomorrow. That's right. I didn't see a specific plan in okay, there. Okay, so there was never a plan that you saw, right? In her journal, prior to any traumatic event. 
prior traumatic event? Well, prior to meeting Mr. Alexander, let's say that. Okay. I don't believe I saw a specific plan. Okay. And uh, to the other thing about uh, this suicide ideation is that you never saw any um, actual threats. We were talking about that. Now, you would consider it a threat because she writes it down in her own journal, right? Uh a threat? Yes. No, I, I wouldn't use the word threat. I would say that it's an indication that she's idealizing and thinking about suicide behavior, which is what that symptom captures. Okay, and this symptom is actually meant to have actual threats of suicide, right? That's one of the things that it lists in the DSM. That's one in addition to idealizing and thinking about it. Okay, so now do you agree with me that you never saw any threats of her actually committing suicide prior to meeting Mr. Alexander? If you're talking, you're using the word threat and planning as, as though they're not, the same thing. I use them differently. I'm not using planning, I'm talking about threat. So threat would be writing it down and indicating that it's, that there's some thought about it. Okay, and so you never saw, so for you that means threat. Yes. Okay. And she never threat had this threat made to anyone else that you know of, right? It was only in her own journal. No, that's not correct. So prior to meeting Mr. Alexander, that she threatened to commit suicide to somebody else? Her friend Zenia indicated that she had mentioned suicide to her. Oh, her friend from fifth grade, right? They met young, and she indicated that they um, sporadically kept in contact. Okay. And again, any reference to that wasn't an actual plan, was it? I don't, I don't know the details of that. I know she had just mentioned that she had been thinking about suicide. Okay. So you don't know the details, but not knowing the details didn't stop you from using it as a data point, right? It is a data point because, as you can read there in the DSM, it indicates that suicidal ideation is, is what's captured under that symptom. What I'm, what I'm asking you is that then you didn't go and ask to interview this Zana person, right, to ask her specifically what she meant by any comments about suicide? No, because it didn't matter. There was the comment of suicide, which, again, is captured under that symptom. Okay. So just the comment of suicide, any comment of suicide. So anybody, anytime anybody says something like, I'm going to commit suicide or I wish I weren't here, that to you falls under this criteria? No, that's not what I said. What I'm saying is I look for a pattern of behavior. Mm -hmm. And in this situation, we're talking about suicide. So I'm looking for a pattern of suicidal ideation. And that's what matters. Well, isn't it true that this pattern that you speak of is really just comments by a teenager who talks about being depressed, right? No. So you don't count these as depressed comments? You're, you're meshing two different things together, again, that suicide specifically has to do with depression. Suicidal behavior can be seen in a number of different disorders, as evidenced with Ms. Arias, who has borderline personality disorder. What I'm asking you is that when somebody talks about wishing they weren't here anymore or that their life isn't worth living, you don't see that as evidence of depression either? I'm saying that, yes, you can see that in depression amongst other disorders. All right. How many comments is it that you that you saw when you and you're referring to just her journals then right besides this Dana person you're referring to just her journals and her parents indicated the same and how many comments is it that you're counting here I didn't count them okay so more than one? Oh yes okay more than ten are we talking back since 1995 yes I don't think that it, I, I can't give a specific number I think it would be misleading to give a specific number <laughs> So you just know more than one? M more than one, definitely more than one, several. For it to be a pattern, I would never consider something a pattern if I just saw it one time. Okay, so several then? Yes. All right. Several from 1995? Yes. You talked about the... Um, Sixth one, the effect of instability due to a marked reactivity of mood, right? Correct. And that you can see uh, what the DSM talks about is irritability or anxiety. Those are two things that are listed there. Okay. And anxiety usually lasting a few hours. Right? If you'd like for me to read it verbatim with you, I can do that also. Would you like me to pull that out? No, I'm reading it. Okay. I'm just asking, do you know this by memory or no? I know most of it by memory, but I wouldn't say that I have it memorized verbatim. Okay. Well, you'd agree that, that the effect of instability talks about anxiety that usually lasts a few hours and only rarely more than a few days, right? 
Right. Okay. And for this, you're, you're saying one of the examples that you used was that in her journals, right? In her journal entries, you would see that she would appear happy on one side of her journal, um, and on the, on the same day or the next day even, she would be sad, right? That was one data point. Okay. And you're aware that you, you talked about the law of attraction, right, on direct? I said bit. that I was aware of it. Okay. And you were aware, and you can see evidence that, that Jody really paid a lot of attention to the law of attraction in her journals, right? Yes. And this was specific to uh, 2006 and on, right? I don't know the specific date, but I did see it in there numerous times. Okay. And the law of attraction, when she would speak of it, she would speak very positively, right? About her life and all the things that she was thankful for. Yes. Okay. And then she would talk, uh, sometimes then, that when she would speak negatively, she would speak about things about Mr. Alexander, right? Sometimes, yes. Okay, and she would talk about how Mr. Alexander, that it was upsetting to her that he would have harsh and critical words for her, right? I believe I saw one comment related to that. Okay, and that would, that would, uh, that created a sad type mood in her journal, didn't it, when she would talk about these things? I don't know that that was specifically related to him, no. You don't know if the harsh, critical words were related to Mr. Alexander? I don't know the exact journal entry you're referring to. Would you like to show that to me? No, I'm asking, I, do you not remember it? You just told me you did. No, what I said is that I remember in her journal seeing the change from happy to sad. Okay. I don't know if it was specifically related to anything to do with Mr. Alexander. But you don't have any specific examples of those dates in her journal, right? I don't have those, no. Okay. And the chronic feelings of emptiness, what does that mean for the DSM? It's described as a person having a sense of just being empty inside, that there's nothing inside of them. Uh, you're using empty twice, so tell me what, it, nothing inside, what does that mean? Is that depression? Describe it for us. The feeling of just being empty, it's a, common, it's a common descriptor that we see in patients who have that sense, that they say inside, I just feel like I don't have anything there. Okay, um, and you're saying that she told you this. She did. And uh, you, of course, spoke to her after uh, she's been charged with murder, right? Yes. And you, of course, spoke to her after she had to kill Mr. Alexander, right? Conclusion, had to kill. Approach. <laughs> So you, when, you, when you spoke to Ms. Arias, you spoke to her after she has already been charged with a crime, right? That's correct. Okay. And the other one that you have is inappropriate intense anger or difficulty controlling anger, right? Yes. And in the DSM it says, as an example, frequent displays of temper, constant anger, recurrent physical fights, right? Right. Uh, you don't have any evidence of recurrent <coughs> physical fights, do you? No, just a, not recurrent physical fights, just the time that she had kicked her mom. Okay. Um, I'm asking you whether or not you have any evidence of constant anger. Internal anger, yes. Okay. And you get that evidence from where? Um, her family members who had indicated that this is a, something that they had seen in her um, throughout most of her life. Most of her life? Yes. Okay, but you're referring to, and, and I know you just wanted to throw out there the, the, when she kicked her mom. That's something that happened when she was a teenager, right? She was younger, yes. Yes, and that's something that happened when she was arguing with her mom, right? I believe so. And you know that she was... I'm, I need to retract that. Okay, you don't know when it happened? No, that there was, if I remember correctly, there was an indication that her mother had made a, a kind, neutral comment to her, and the response was negative. Okay, that's, that's what your information is? I believe so, yes. Okay, so then I guess, are you aware that the fact that, that the time when, when uh, Miss Arias was a teenager, that her mother would argue with her back, right? 
Do you know this? Would what? Her mother would argue with her. Yes, there, she indicated that there was a lot of arguing. Okay, and that her mother would hit her. Yes, that's what she reported to me. But the only thing that you want to take into account is that Miss Arias hit her back. No, that's right? not the only thing I want to take into account. Well, you're using that as a data point, right? That she hit her, yes, for that symptom, yes. And you're using it that as a data point for inappropriate intense anger? As one data point, yes. Okay. And also, it talks about frequent displays of temper. You don't have that, do you? Do I have that? You don't have that as a data point for, for Jody. frequent displays of temper? Yes, that she, people would describe her as being irritable and upset. Okay. And uh, they also described her as being very happy, don't they? Yes, other people do describe her as that. And being very pleasant and kind. Yes. And they describe her as being very caring. Yes, some people do. Yes, and describe her as being very loving. Some people did describe her as that. And I believe for this criteria, you wanted to use an email from Miss Arias to Mr. Alexander, right? On February 14th? Yes. And in this email, she says she's talking to Mr. Alexander, right? Through, I mean, through email, right? Yes. And I'm showing you exhibit number 623. Uh, and she's telling, she writes to Travis that she's sorry that the last few days have been frustrating for him, right? Yes. And she wishes that she can give him more consolation. Yes. And she says that she was at a loss for words. Right? Yes. And that she's a little bit intimidated. Not necessarily because of his anger, but she, she wasn't sure how he would react to her trying to comfort him, right? Yes. So she's talking about how she's trying to comfort him. Yes, she was. And she says that uh, she compares it to her own experiences, that sometimes she doesn't want to hear it, and she just wants to yell and scream and vent, right? Yes. And then she puts in, quote, in uh, parentheses, yes, I do, on very rare occasions, right? Yes. And then she wants to go, and that she talks about going through the motions until the situation plays itself out. Right? I'm still reading. Oh, okay. Yes. And she talks about needing comforting sometimes. Yes. And she talks about how her heart filled with compassion for Travis. Yes, she did. Okay. And when you were talking to the prosecutor about this email, you didn't go through any of this part, right? I had read that. Right. Not with the prosecutor on direct, right? You didn't tell the jury about it. Correct. We read the second paragraph. Okay. And it's clear from the first paragraph that apparently there is something, there was something going on prior to February 14th between Mr. Ari that, that Mr. Alexander was upset about, right? Yes. Because she's talking about his anger. About him being frustrated. Right, and, and that and his anger too, right? Because of how angry you were. Yes. And then she goes on to talk about, to kind of pump him up, doesn't she? When she says that after she hung up with him, that she continued to cry for a few minutes. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Um, and so she's talking about how she was crying after she hangs up with Mr. Alexander. Yes. And that she was feeling miserable and hopeless. And then suddenly she thought of him and she knew that um, she stopped crying and she began to feel wonderful, right? Is that what the rest of that says? Yes. Do you need to read it? Go ahead. I see the part that you're referencing now. <clears throat> and she talks about how lucky she is to have him in her, uh, in her life, right? Yes. And so saying this to somebody, it would make them feel good, wouldn't it? They're kind words. Yeah. And so she's saying kind words to him, isn't she? Yes. Yes. 
and she talks uh, about the future and how um, <coughs> talking about today's, she's specifically referencing today's lesson has been difficult and was not fun, but the general idea is that once we learn the lessons that we don't repeat them anymore, right? She's talking in a very positive manner with him, isn't she? Yes. And that she... Uh, and that she hopes that he feels better and to remember that no matter how ugly it gets, that she's just a phone call away, right? Yes. When you went through this email with the prosecutor on direct, you didn't tell the jury any of the other kind words that Miss Aries had to say, right? Right. And knowing that you were going to use this email as a data point in your diagnosis to borderline, um, you didn't talk to Jody about it, right? Did I talk to her about? About the email. No. You never asked her what she specifically meant when she talks. What, the part that you use is that she says that she's never beaten anybody up, but she, her anger, she's kicked holes in walls and kicked down doors and smashed windows, right? Right. And knowing that you were going to use this as a data point, as you say, you never talked to her about it, right? I don't believe I'd read it at that point. Okay, so you never went back and talked to her about it? No, I didn't go back. You never asked to clarify, well, what did you mean by this, Jody? How often did this happen? You didn't ask her those questions? No. And you didn't ask her then, uh, so you have no idea if what she says in this paragraph is true or not, right? Just like with everything else, it's just another data point. Okay, but it's a data point that you used to form a criteria or an opinion about borderline personality, right? Not independently. You used it to form one of the things to form your opinion about borderline personality, right? As one of the pieces of information, yes, I did. All right, you conducted uh, uh, the MMPI, right? Yes. Can you tell us what that is? It's a self-report measure. Um, it, there's a 567 questions, true or false. It captures personality traits in general psychopathology. And this was a test that you gave, right? Yes. Uh, and in this test, you said you computer scored it? Yes. Uh, and you said you did it twice? Did I hear you say that or no? The computer makes you do it twice. Okay. So that's acceptable then to score the MMPI twice because the computer makes you do it? It's part of the protocol when you're entering it. Okay, so part of the, and which computer scoring company did you use? This is with, um, I believe it's Pearson. Pearson, okay. I'd have to double check on that. All right, and do you it's have? It's called Q Local. Uh, I'm sorry? I'm sorry, it's called Q Local is the name of it. Okay, and do you have your, um, the computer uh when you put it into the computer and, and it scores it, it spits you out something like graphs and charts, things like that, right? Yes, T-scores. And, and do you have that with you? I do. Can you take those out, please? Sure. And I'm looking for all the scales. Because you, you said you did all of the scales, right? Not just, uh, not just the validity and clinical. Right. So you're not asking for the raw data, you're asking for the score report? No. Right, I don't want the raw data. Ladies and gentlemen, please be back in the jury room at 11.15 and we will start promptly at that time. Please remember the admonition. Please approach. The meaning of the words. Yes. And so you just want to look at the words and that and use that as a data point, right? Yes. And in looking at the words, and you and you basically get different data points from all over then, right? Yes. That you pull together. Right? Yes. Okay. And you're familiar with a, an email, string of emails that went back and forth between Mr. Alexander and Mr. and Mrs. Hughes? Yes. 
And you know in this email then that at one point, Mr. Alexander, he's talking very highly of Miss Arias, isn't he? Yes. And how much he really like, well, the, how much he really is into her, right? That he was interested in her, yes. Right, and that he adores her. I don't recall those exact words. If you want to show me, I'm happy to look at it. I'm not speaking in exact words, but oh. the context of the email itself, he's very fond of her, isn't he? He felt fondly of her, yes. And he actually, in his own words, talks about that everybody can agree that they don't get more honest than Jody, right? I don't know that specifically, but I, again, I'd be happy to look at sure. the email you're referring to. May I approach? May. At the top of the page. The part that's underlined, yes. Yes, okay. And so, and so he's talking then about the fact that they don't come more honest than Jody, right? Yes, that's what he said. And that's something that is in written word. Yes. Something that you don't want to go behind the meaning of, right? right. And you'll use that as a data point. Yes. And you'll also use his data points the fact that uh, Mr. Alexander was very fond of Miss Arius. Yes. And that he speaks very highly of her. He did in that email. And that he worries that the things that Mr. Miss, that Mr. and Mrs. Hughes said to her was upsetting for Jody, yes. right? Yes. And when we go down the road to May 26th of 2008, you're familiar with an, a uh, instant messaging, right? Instant messaging between uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Alexander and Miss Arias. There were there were several different ones. Which one are you referring to? May twenty sixth. I don't know that exact date. Okay, like but you reviewed see. all these instant messages, yes. right? Yes. Okay. And part of your review of the instant messages, you also reviewed the text messages. Yes. And in reviewing those things, you you would agree that there were times when Mr. Alexander was quite upset with Jody, right? Yes. And he showed his anger with Jody in his text messages, didn't he? Yes. And he called her all kinds of names. He called her names, yes. And do you know what character assassination is? Yes. And isn't that when names become actually so severe that it cuts down the person's own character, their own being? I think that would be one definition, yes. Okay. And you'd agree that a lot of these names that he was calling her was actually character assassination, wasn't it? They were harsh names, yes. And you wouldn't consider that to be okay? No, that's not okay. And in fact, that was abusive, wasn't it? Abuse implies that it's a pattern of behavior. I would say that that behavior was certainly inappropriate and not a healthy communication style. Okay, but you don't consider it abusive? I would say, again, the word abuse implies a pattern of behavior. Well, let's not, we can talk about patterns in a second, okay. but the word, I'm talking about the word abuse. So you mean that unless it's repeated, this one particular instant wouldn't be considered abusive to you? If we define abuse as a misuse of something? No, Dr. Just Marte, a misuse, yes. Hold on a second. What I'm asking you is this one particular instant, on May 26, let's say, when Mr. Alexander, as you've agreed, was calling her names consistent yes. with character assassination, you, would, you wouldn't agree that that's abusive? I'm trying to explain to you what I mean. Well, I'm asking, you're telling me that abuse is a pattern. So if it's, if it's just one instant, then is that not abuse? I'd like to clarify. Can I speak? It's a yes or no question. I don't believe I can answer in yes or no. All right. So then, so then that's a no. No, I just said I can't answer you in yes or no. All right. So then let's talk about patterns. You want to talk about patterns. And, and when we talk about abuse, you want to look for more than one instance of it, right? For you to characterize it as abuse? I, again, would like to clarify that. Do you want to see a pattern when you're looking at abuse? I'd like to clarify that. Clarify the fact that what whether or not you want to look at a pattern? <clears throat> what I've been trying to clarify. I, I, I'm moving on. So I'm just asking the question, do you want to see a pattern when you're looking for abuse? It depends on how the word abuse is used. That's what I'm trying to explain to you. If it's implied that there's a pattern, no. If you're talking about the word abuse as being a misuse of something in one instance, then you can use the word abuse in a single incident, yes. Okay. Is that, did you clarify enough? I did, thank you. All right, you're welcome. So what I'm asking you is when you're looking at abuse in a relationship, do you look for patterns? Yes. Okay. And when you, some of this abuse, you would agree that it can be psychological abuse, right? 
Yes. And in fact, psychological abuse can be very damaging to a person, right? It can be damaging. Um, and when we look at psychological abuse, you can look at the written word, right? Yes. And so on May 26th, when Mr. Alexander is calling uh, Miss Arias a freaking whore, do you consider that particular word to be bad? Yes. Do you consider it to be mean? Yes. Do you consider it to be a word that you'd cap, uh, that cuts her down? Yes. Do you consider it to be mean when he talks about uh, that he's never had to deal with a more solid form of evil? Is that mean? Those are not kind words. So is that mean then? Yes, I would put it in that category. Okay. And when you talk about this conversation on May 26th, if you know that he has called her these types of names before this, let's talk about May 10th, or if he's called her names on April 8th or April 7th or March 30th, don't we start to see a pattern? Are you talking about a hypothetical? No, I'm asking, you've read through the text messages, right? I have. And you know that he calls her names, right? Very rarely, yes. You think very rarely he yes, calls I her names? Yes, I would say that. Okay. And so, uh, how do you define rare? I would say that it happened periodically, the pattern that I saw, that it was in response to him feeling like she was being intrusive or had crossed a boundary. Um, and he was putting up very firm boundaries. That's not what I'm asking you. I'm talking about rare. So and rare is once or twice or more. How, are you asking me in this situation how many times it happened or just no, the definition I'm of rare? You, you said he rarely was abusive right. to her. Yes. So, um, and actually you said he rarely called her names, but are you yes. going to are you going to use the word abusive with that or just calling names? Calling names. Okay. And so you consider the all the numerous text messages that you've read and the numerous instant messages that you've read between the two of them, you would consider any time he ever called her names, that was just happened rarely, right? I would say that it happened infrequently. I think that's a better word. Frequently? Infrequently. Oh, infrequently. Better than rarely. That's probably a word that I would use, yes. And infrequently is, is what then? It's Do not you? often. It's a handful of times. Okay. And so a handful of times then becomes, what, less relevant to you? No, that's not less relevant. So it's more relevant? No, it's relevant. It's relevant, okay. Yes. And when you're talking about then this, uh, um, do you think it's acceptable behavior for him to act like this? I think any time people speak to each other like that, that's not acceptable behavior. Okay, so you'd agree that he was acting in an unacceptable way, right? He had an unhealthy communication pattern. Oh, he had an unhealthy... So in he those spoke, moments. So he spoke enough times to her in this manner that you would say that it was an unhealthy communication pattern, right? In those moments. You just called it a pattern, right? Yes, in those moments. No, you just called it a pattern. You're talking about the unhealthy communication he had with her as a pattern, right? In those exchanges. There were lengthy exchanges. That's so now, what I was referring to. The so pattern now, within the exchanges. So now you want to call it a pattern when you're just talking about one conversation? Within the exchanges. They were long exchanges. Right. So these long exchanges, just one exchange is considered a pattern to you? It, in the way that they were written between the two of them, they were long exchanges between the two of them. So within that, within that exchange, yes, I would say that there was a pattern in that response. Okay, so within that one response, you're going to say there's a pattern of how he responds. Because he used multiple different words, like you just highlighted. So there is a pattern in his response in, in these responses, right? In those exchanges, yes. Okay, and in this pattern of his responses, you see a pattern of him being, of calling her bad names, right? Yes, the pattern I see is that he's responding. The pattern that you see in these exchanges is one of him calling her bad names, right? Yes. Okay. And assaulting her character, right? Yes. And calling her names like whore. Yes. And slut. Yes? I don't remember that specifically, but if you have it in front of you, I'd be happy to look at it. You don't remember him calling her a slut? That name in particular, no. Okay. It's possible. Well, I could you look at it. Okay, well, you remember uh, that he talks about having her living a life identical to Satan. Do you I remember do that? I do recall something similar to that. And telling her that she's worthless. Do you remember that? Something similar to that. 
You remember him calling her a three-hole wonder? I do remember that. And so in this pattern of during this conversation, he is being abusive, isn't he? Yes, he was using words that were very unkind and maladaptive. Okay, and so this is the instant messaging that happens on May 26th. There's mm -hmm. also uh, a text message from May 26th, isn't there? Do you remember that? I remember there were numerous text messages. I'd be happy to look at it. All right, well, you understand that, that the instant messaging on May 26 is preceded by text messages, or, or do you not remember that? I know that there was um, IMs and also uh, text messages. Okay, and so in text messages, he also called her names, didn't he? I don't know if it's that specific date. Again, I'd like to see the documents that you're referring to. Well, let's not talk about a specific date. Okay. Just in text messages that re you reviewed, you know that there were messages, these... Um, conversations between the two of them that you would characterize as a pattern, right? I would say that they were infrequent comments that were made. No, you called it a pattern earlier. Are you taking that back? I'm not taking anything back. You're changing my words. No. Did you not just say pattern just a few minutes ago? I said pattern in those specific exchanges, that there was a pattern within. You're talking about now a pattern across. That's a very different presentation. No, I'm not talking about that. So may, let me make sure that you understand Please me, okay? Clarify. So I'm talking about in a specific text message conversation. You read through all their text messages, didn't you? I did. Okay. And when you read through the text messages, did you see within, uh, let's talk about just one conversation, when he's upset with her? Yes. Just any particular one. Okay. Within that conversation, you see a pattern, don't you, of him calling her bad names again? Within the text messages, yes. Okay. So we have one that we know of from, March, from May 26th, right? That's the date you gave me, yes. Okay. And then you've seen another conversation when he is extremely uh, calling her bad names, right? Yes. And you consider that to be another pattern within that conversation. Are you now highlight highlighting a third instance, or are you still talking about that second, second. one? Yes. Okay. And uh, you had other um, communications, uh, or they, you reviewed other communications between them, where there was a third time when he is calling her bad names, right? I'd like to see that. Do you not remember that? I remember that there, again, were infrequent um, situations. Well, I know you, you keep wanting to say infrequent, but you're not giving me any information as to that infrequency. We're, what we're talking about here is specific conversations where you're telling me within this conversation there is a pattern of him uh, calling her bad names and yes. character assassination, right? Judging by a date and time. Conversation. Oh. Oh, what I'm saying to you is that in order to be accurate in how I respond, I'd like to see what you're referring to so that I'm not misleading in any kind of way. Because you wouldn't want to be misleading, right? Correct. And you wouldn't want to, uh, you wouldn't want to add anything into your answers just to mislead people, right? Right. I don't want to mislead anybody. Okay. So, so we can agree then that, that you would want to just answer the questions as they're posed so that you don't give any misleading information. Right. Okay. You were asked questions about uh, when Mr. Alexander made comments about being afraid of Miss Arius, right? Yes. And that you wouldn't want to go behind those words, right? Right. You wouldn't want to do any further investigation as to why he might say something like that, right? I can't do that, he's not alive. Right, but you wouldn't want to use any of your other data points to, to investigate why he might say that? I would use this as an objective data point that I would then use in addition to everything else, putting it together, but I wouldn't alter the words. It's not possible to alter the words. No, you wouldn't want to alter the words, but wouldn't you want to understand and put those words in context? In, would I look at it in context? Yes, I would look at it right. in context. And you would want to look at then behaviors and investigate maybe 
uh, whether or not this, there's any true meaning behind these words, right? I couldn't do that because he's not alive. You, um, so when somebody's not alive, you can't get any information from them. Is that what you mean? From them directly? That's correct because they're not alive. So you can't make any type of, you can't make any type of, um, do any type of an evaluation as to anything that he says in written word because you can't look at other data points with regard to Mr. Alexander. No, you, you, um, what I was referring to is what we started talking about was going behind the word and getting more information about those words in particular. That's what I was speaking about. Right. And so to try and go, to try and get put meaning to that word, what I'm saying is, is that you don't want to look at any other data points that relate to what he's saying in these words, right? No, I would absolutely look at other data points, but I wouldn't change the actual wording. I wouldn't be able to go behind it, but I'd well, be able to have other data points that I would then integrate. Right. Okay. So, may, may we approach very quickly? Yes. This time, please be back in the designated area at 125. Please remember the admonition, you are excused. record will show the jury has left the courtroom. Counsel, anything before the noon recess? No, we are at recess. Until around the age of 18, it may have been 17, and then after that it was 10 restaurants. So you're aware that the 10 restaurants was during a time period of 15 years. Do you know this or not? It wasn't over 15 years. It was over, that would have been eight years. As I just indicated, she worked with her father until 18 or somewhere around there. Okay, so you think it's just a period of eight years? Whatever, 18 until she was incarcerated, yes. All right. And during this time, you know that these restaurants, that these different restaurants that she worked at were also, she was working at more than one at a time, right? I'm not aware of that. You didn't get that information in your no. interview with her? Correct. And... When you told us about some of the uh, suicide ideation and you used as a data point the fact that she mentioned suicide to her mother, you remember that? Yes. You didn't tell us that when she mentioned suicide to her mother, that was actually after June 4th, 2008, right? I believe it was after. Okay, so you're considering as a data point something after the trauma that she, that she suffered. Absolutely, looking at a pattern of behavior. Okay, and so you're going to look at then information 
uh, when you're trying to diagnose borderline, you're going to look at information that occurs after a traumatic event. Yes, because right? personality is stable. All right. And so even though the DSM tells you not to do that, right? The DSM does not say not to do that. Didn't you agree with me earlier that the DSM tells you that if you're looking at borderline personality, you need to look at a pattern from the beginning. And if there's a traumatic event, you want to make sure that this pattern is before the traumatic event, right? No. No, that's not what it says? No. So then you didn't agree with me before? It, restate your question so that I could be clear about what you're asking. When you're talking about diagnosing borderline personality, okay. okay, don't you need to make sure that you're looking at a pattern throughout the person's life, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And if you're looking at a pattern throughout the person's life, when there is a trauma, when that person goes through a trauma, don't you want to make sure that the pattern exists before the trauma? Yes. Okay. You talked about her um, going from boyfriend and boyfriend and needing this, having this strong attachment, right? Yes. But you didn't talk about the fact that when she broke up with Mr. McCartney, she was single for 14 months before she even started dating Mr. Brewer, right? That wasn't my understanding. Oh, you didn't know that? My understanding was is that right after Matt, she was dating Daryl. So you didn't clarify that with her then in your interview? No, that's the information that I received. Uh, not from Asarius, though. I can reference my notes if you'd like. Sure. Do you have those with you or do you need They're them? They're right here. They will, okay. consistent with what I just said. So it's consistent then that she broke up with Mr. McCartney in September of 2001? She told me that, I, I don't know those exact dates that she broke up. Okay. Uh, well then are you aware that she didn't start dating Mr. Brewer until November of 2002? I could tell you what she told me. Okay, but that's all you can tell us, right? Because you spent 12 hours with her, right? I did spend 12 hours with her. And you never went back to clarify any information with her, right? That it wasn't a point of confusion for me. Sure. So I so, didn't need to go back and clarify it. So you didn't feel that there was any confusion on your part at all? Right. My notes were very clear about her the, her, the timeline of what she dated. Okay. And your notes were done in just a period of the 12 hours that you spent with her, right? Yes. So in that 12 hours then, you somehow think that she went directly from Mr. McCartney and started dating Mr. Brewer immediately. That's what you think? Not somehow. That's what the information I was given. That's what you are basing your opinion on, right? That's what you think? Yes, based on the notes I received. Well, you didn't receive those notes. You wrote those notes, right? That's a correct. Yes, okay. I wrote the notes. You talked about um, having this strong attachment partly due to the fact that um, she moved to Mesa, right? A even after, they, after June of 2007. That, that right. would be one indicator, yes. Okay. But she didn't talk about the fact that she moved away from Mr. Alexander in April of 2008, didn't she? Yes. And she left, she moved away to a whole other state, didn't she? Yes. And then in her journal entry, she talked about moving on, right? Yes. And she tried to move on by uh, joining a dating service, LDS LinkUp, right? I wasn't aware of that. Oh, you didn't know that? No. It was in her journals. You didn't read that? I read her journals. But you don't remember it then? I don't remember a specific dating website, no. Okay. So you don't remember then that she was attempting to meet other people? I was aware of that. Okay. And, uh, and that she was doing this in April and May of 2008, after she moved away from Mr. Alexander? I was aware that she was trying to date other people, yes. That she was moving away from Mr. Alexander, right? Yes. When we talk about calling, uh, the fact that Mr. Alexander called her names, uh, you know that this started in January of 2007 when he called her a skank, right? Yes, that's what she told me. And, and then he tried to pretend like he was just kidding, right? I don't know if tried to pretend, pretend she told me that he indicated that it was a joke. Okay. So he then told her he was just kidding, right? That's what she told me, yes. 
And you know about this situation too because this is something that you would have read in the emails between Mr. and Mrs. Hughes to Mr. Alexander, right? Yes. And they're discussing their concern about the way that Mr. Alexander was treating Jody, right? Yes. And you know from your review of the record, there, there's no question about the fact that Mr. Alexander had called Miss Arias names like whore, right? Yes. And he's called her names like slut? Yes. And, uh, and just because he calls her these names, that doesn't make it true, right? Doesn't make what true? The fa that doesn't make it true for him to call her this name. You wouldn't just accept the written word that it must be true then, right? That what must be true? That she's a whore? If he calls her a name, do you think that that means it's necessarily true? If he calls her a name, that's just what he called her. That's what I, is true, that he called her that. Okay. And you would consider that abusive, wouldn't you? We're going back to the word abuse, meaning the misuse of something. So it was a misuse of words. So I would say in that situation, yes, it was a misuse of words. Okay. So if somebody called someone you know or you love a whore or a slut, you would just tell them that's a misuse of words, right? I'd say that's inappropriate. Okay. And uh, despite knowing that there is this name calling that's going on and escalating throughout the relationship, you would still not term this as a pattern of verbal abuse, right? That's correct. And you would make that opinion based on the fact, or despite the fact, that you are not a domestic violence expert. I've worked with a lot of people who have experienced domestic violence. But you told us yesterday that you are not a domestic violence expert, right? I did based on the idea that I do not have a license in domestic violence. There, what license is there in domestic violence? That's exactly why I said that. There is no license in domestic violence. I, I told you that I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and I'm an expert as a clinical psychologist because my definition of expert is license. Are, are, you agree, are we going to go back to this? The, sure. The fact that you're saying that somebody needs to be licensed to be an expert in domestic violence? No, I was asking you what your definition was, and you didn't provide one for me. My definition would be licensure indicates someone has an expertise in that area. And that's so what anybody who doesn't have a license in something means that they're not an expert. Is that what you're telling me? It depends on the definition. Okay, so according to your depending on a definition now, yes. you're taking it back that you, you think you are an expert in domestic violence? Is that where we're going? Yes, I have a lot of experience in domestic violence. Okay, so yesterday you were not an expert in domestic violence, but now today you are. I just gave you an example of why I said that, or not an example, I gave you the reason why, that I was basing it on licensure status. I indicated that I have a license as a clinical psychologist. So the fact that there is no license that a person can get to make them an expert in domestic violence, you would still say that somehow you're not an expert because you don't have this license that doesn't exist. That's the criteria I was basing it on when you asked me that question. Okay, so the fact that you don't have a license in domestic violence, a license that doesn't exist, that's why you're not an expert. That's what I was basing it on. Okay, so somehow if, there, if this magical license somehow appears and you are able to receive a license in domestic violence, then you can become an expert. Is that what you're telling us? Based on the criteria that I was conceptualizing it, yes. And as we speak right now, there is no such thing, right? That's correct. On January 24th, 2008, there was, a, there was a journal entry. I'm showing you Exhibit 511. You talked about this. This is uh, two days after Mr. Alexander threw Miss Arias down and broke her finger, right? January 24th? She just told me. That isn't evidence. She indicated to me it was in January of 2008. So you don't know the specific date? Right. Okay. But yet you were asked questions about the fact that on January 24th, she writes that there's nothing noteworthy to report, right? Yes. And you consider that to be a data point? Yes. Isn't it also a point of data that on the same day, she talks about the fact that she cannot marry Travis, right? Yes. And the fact that she can't quite put her finger on it, but something is just off with that boy? Yes. And she also talks on that same day that we all have got head problems, that's for sure, but there's 
but there are certain things that will never sit right with her, right? Yes. All right, earlier, uh, you told me that you conducted the MMPI, right? Yes. And uh, a computer scored it for you? Yes. And, the compu and when the computer scored it, it created a report, right? Um, it, yes. And in that report, that's something that you, uh, it, uh, that you reviewed, the report? Yes. And you determined it to be accurate? Yes. And you gave me that report earlier, right? Yes. All right, I'm going to show you Exhibit 631. Can you flip through there, please, and tell me, is that the report that you received from the MMPI when you had it scored? Yes, I'm assuming this is the one I gave you. Yes. It is. Well, just make sure. I mean, is that, is that it? Yes, it looks like it. Okay. And this report is accurate, right? Yes. And does it look complete to you? Yes. And these are the results that you used in uh, making any opinions about this case, right? Correct. Judge, at this time I'd move for that evidence to be entered. Exhibit 631, I think. Yes. No objection. 631 is admitted. All right, so we're looking at the MMPI. I know that we're going to look at some charts. And we've talked a lot about scales, right? There's, it measures yes. different, it has different scales on this test. Yes. And on the left-hand side of this chart, we're looking at page two. Well, we're looking at page two. On the left-hand side of this chart, this is the validity scales, right? Yes. And then the right-hand side of the chart is the clinical scales. Correct. And the validity scales tell us, you know from looking at those numbers in that charting that this is a valid represent, or this is a valid test, right? Yes. There were no issues with it. Right. All right, and then let's take a look at the scales on the right. For a second. Um, you see where it says D? Yes. What's that? Depression. All right. And we see, and depression, we see it going over this line here, right? That's correct. That line is set at 65? That's correct. And that's the clinically significant line, right? Yes. So we're looking at then D for depression, and that is far above the clinically significant line, isn't it? Yes. And let's take a look at a PD. Can you tell us what that means? Psychopathic deviant. Okay. And we know that these, these scales are further broken down, aren't they? Yes. And we give explanations of how they're broken down later on on page 8, right? Yes. Okay. So we see psychopathic deviant subscales, right? Yes. And so some of the things that's going to make this scale elevated is familial discord, yes. right? Authority problems. Yes. And we know at the time that this MMPI is given that Jody's in custody, right? She's yes. been arrested. She was. And uh, social alienation, self-alienation, right? Yes. And you're aware, given your, given your experience that you've told us that you have, that um, having a highly elevated uh, scale in PD is often uh, elevated in victims of abuse, right? It's sometimes elevated, yes. And that's something that uh, is elevated, too, when you're, uh, that you know that they're elevated when people have, are victims of trauma. It can be elevated with victims of trauma because oftentimes they become perpetrators themselves. It can be elevated when they're victims of trauma, right? Yes. That's what I asked you. Sometimes, yes. Well, and you know that in your, in your experience that you're telling us that you have, right? And I'm telling you that sometimes, yes.
All right, now there's more scales than just the ones that we're just looking at here on page two, right? That's correct. And if we look at page four and we look at the restructured clinical scales, we talk some more about some of the different scales that are measured, right? Right, is, right. if you might reference my report, this is, these are not scales that I interpret. So you didn't look at these? These are not ones that I interpret because they do not have as much um, research back into them. So, so when you say you didn't interpret it, does that mean that you didn't look at these? They're not something I considered. That's correct. Oh, okay. So you didn't use any of these scales other than page two? Other than page two? No, the I used... The one that we just looked at. That's incorrect. So you did look at other scales? Yes, other scales. Just not this one? Right. This doesn't have as much research back into it. The common protocol is to examine the clinical scales, the content scales, and supplementary scales, as I highlighted in my report. Okay. Well, we'll look at those two, but okay. let's take a look at this one for right now. Um, we're talking about, let's see, we see LPE. Can you tell us what that is? These aren't scales that I typically interpret. These aren't things that I've taken in consideration or looked at. So you can't tell me what LPE is? I can't give you an interpretation on these. I've not spent time looking at them. So you don't know what LPE means. That's what I'm asking you. Not off the top of my head. Okay. Well, let's, we'll, we'll, we'll go down here. So it actually has it. So LPE, low of positive emotions, right? Okay. All right. And we see that... LPE, that's above the clinical significant level, isn't it? Yes. And we see that it is a T-score of 70, isn't it? Whoops. Right there? Looks like it, yes. And low positive emotion, that means, that means um, basically the opposite of self-esteem, doesn't it? These are scales that I do not commonly use. I'm not going to interpret anything that I did not interpret in this case. Are, well, are you telling me that you don't even know what low positive, what, what LPE means? I'm telling you that I do not use these scales at all. So you don't know what it means at all? Right. I do not use this at all. It's not part of the standard protocol. Even though the computer, when you score it, it comes back, it tells you what this information is, doesn't it? Right. But it's my job as a psychologist to determine what has the most empirical backing to it. And you choose not to use this one, right? I did, for every case. Oh, for every case. Okay. Yes. Well, let's, let's see what we can figure out on... Uh, Let's see what we can figure out then, okay? So LPE, we know, is low positive emotions. Are you telling me that you don't know what low positive emotion means? What I'm telling you is that the descriptor on the MMPI, the actual labels, are not always indicative of what they actually interpret to mean. So, so what you're telling me in it is that you don't know what low positive emotion means as to the MMPI. That's correct. Okay. How about the content scales? Do you know what these are? Yes. All right, so on the content scales, we see an ANX. What's that? Anxiety. All right, and anxiety, is that, that's elevated, right? Yes. Uh, and that's at a T-score of 76, right? If you could move Can it up see? a little bit, thank you. Yes. All right, and again, the clinical, the... Uh, Clinical level at this point is 65, right? Correct. And so we see that her anxiety is elevated, right? Yes. And then DEP, what's that? Depression. And we see that depression is elevated, isn't it? Yes. And we see BIZ, what's that? Bizarre mentation. Bizarre thoughts? What did yes. you say? Yes, bizarre mentation. Okay, which means bizarre thoughts, is that right? That's a simplistic way of putting it, yes. Okay, and so... Uh, in the simplistic way, bizarre thoughts are also elevated, right? That's correct. And because of your background and your experience, you know that these three things, anxiety, depression, and bizarre thoughts, those three things often come are associated with trauma, aren't they? Amongst other things, yes, they are. And ASP, what's that? Antisocial. Personality, right? To get the exact verbiage, I'd be happy to refer to my notes. May I do that? Sure. Do you have notes on the MMPI in there? I've already given them to you. Oh, well, then what else do you have to refer to? I have. I can show you. They're already in. Uh, I gave it before. Do you need me to get the marks? Sure. Just 
have a list of the scale names. I don't know what number it was. Oh, I have to it. I gave it. This way. I guess, are you looking for something that tells you what AS, ASP is? I just want to make sure I'm using the correct verb. It just it has the titles of them. Okay. Do, do you disagree? It's antisocial personality, isn't it? If, if I could look to verify that. Sure. This one only has the highlighted ones. Yes. So antisocial personality, right? I believe so. Okay. And antisocial personality, that is below even average, isn't it? Yes. And then let's take a look at LSE. Do you know what that is? Low self-esteem. All right, and, and that one you know means the opposite of high self-esteem, right? There's no question on that one. There is. That one's broken down into two, which you can see later on if you keep turning the page. That it's what? It's broken down into two like you highlighted earlier with the Harris Lingos. Okay, do you want to look at those? Sure. Okay, so let's take a look at low self-esteem, right? Yes. Okay, so that's broken down into self-doubt. Yes. And submissiveness, right? Yes. So the low self-esteem that we see on this scale... Is low self-doubt, which is self-concept. Well, we just, we just saw that it was broken down, right? Right, and, the, and that in, the self-doubt is self-concept, identity. Okay, let, let, let me just be clear about this. Sure. All right, so we're looking at low self-doubt self and submissiveness, right? That's correct. And that's how they're broken down? Yes. And then we're looking at T-scores. So you're looking at 68 for the self-doubt and 60 for the submissiveness. Correct. Um, can you tell us what A and G means? Anger. Anger. And that is... Is that anything we need to... No. Okay. All right. Anger. And we see anger at average, right? Yes. Below clinically significant. Yes. And in fact, let's take a look at the anger subscales. You, that would be an inappropriate use of the MMPI. Well, let's take a look at them anyway. They're not interpretable. We're looking at anger subscales. We look at explosive behavior, right? Yes. Is that a yes? Yes. And we look at irritability, right? Yes. And on both of those, um, so as a total on the anger subscale, she scored at normal, right? Normal range. On the anger subscale, yes. Well, on the anger scale together, right? Yes. All right, do you know anything about the supplementary scales? Yes. All right. <coughs> okay, let's talk about A. What's A? Anxiety. All right, and in that one, she's elevated in anxiety, isn't she? Correct. And let's see. We have R. What's R? I believe R is repression. Repressed or blocking unpleasant thoughts, right? Yes. And we have that. That's showing not to the clinical amount, but it's above normal, isn't it? Still below the clinical threshold. It's above normal, right? Yes. And then ES, can you tell us what that is? I believe it's ego strength. Okay, and ego strength, that's actually far below normal, isn't it? Yes. So that would mean the ego strength, or having ego strength, that means it's uh, not very much. There's not very much there, right? It's below average. And what's DO? I believe that's dominance. Okay, and when we're talking about dominance, um, that also actually, dominance, that's also very low, isn't it? 
It is. Uh, below normal, right? It's below the clinical threshold, yes. Well, it's below the clinical threshold, but it's also below average, isn't it? Yes, it's below 50. And PK, what's PK? PTSD. PTSD, oh, PTSD, and PTSD is actually elevated, isn't it? Yes. And it's elevated to 77, isn't it? Yes. So that's above the clinical line, isn't it? Yes. OH, can you tell me what OH means? <coughs> I believe OH has, um, it's a alcohol scale. Actually, isn't it over-controlled hostility? I, I would need to reference the manual to have the exact terms. It's not typical to interpret under the threshold. Do you have the manual to be able to find out what it is? Unless you want to just accept that it's over controlled hostility. Do you do think have, that's wrong? I would, I would like to be specific. I do have the manual. You do? Okay, go ahead and tell. You do or you don't? I do. Okay, go ahead and look at it then. Tell us what OH means. Over-controlled hostility. Okay. All right. So let me know when you're finished. Okay. I'm finished. Okay. So OH then is over-controlled hostility, right? Correct. That's what you just said. And that is also below average, isn't it? Yes. And again, with this, with this scale, we're starting to see a pattern, aren't we, of anxiety Right? And low self-esteem? No, I don't see that pattern. With oh. low self-esteem? Yeah. You, you've seen anxiety on more than one scale now, haven't you? Anxiety, yes. Okay. And now we've seen low ego strength and we've seen... Um, the low self, right? Which was low self-concept? Yeah. Which is identity disturbance? No, I'm talking about low self-concept having... I explained right. earlier what that, meant, what mean, what that means. Mm -hmm. We talked about it meaning self-doubt and submissiveness, right? That's how these scales are subscaled. If you look over to the T-score, you'll see that only self-doubt is elevated, not submissiveness. Well, and submissiveness is elevated above normal, right? You, it's not interpretable. You're interpreting it improperly. I'm not interpreting it. I'm telling you, you are that by it's, saying I'm, that. I'm asking you the question. Okay. It's above normal, isn't it? It's not above the clinical threshold. I didn't ask you that. I asked you if it was above average. It's above 50. Yes, and average is 50, right? Yes. So it's above average. Yes. Okay. And so when we talk about low self-esteem, we're talking about self-doubt and submiss submiss submissiveness, right? According and to generally speaking. When we're talking about self, when we're talking about low self-esteem or low self-esteem subscales, we're talking about self-doubt and submiss huh, submissiveness. Yes, and okay. remember that the label doesn't go with the description. Self-doubt means a poor sense of self, identity disturbance. Okay, and then we see on the next scales, we see that there's we've seen depression, right? Yes. And anxiety, right? Yes. And we've seen low scales in dominance. Yes? Yes. And these are all associated, I'm sure you know, with battered women, right? All what? Anxiety, depression? Anxiety, depression, low self-image, self, low self-esteem. Those are things you can see in battered women. Yes. And these are all things that we're seeing on Jody scales, right? Yes. Can you tell us what AGGR is? 
As I highlighted earlier, there are three, three scales that I interpret, the clinical, content, and supplementary. Those are the ones that have the most empirical backing. Can you to tell them. us what AGGR means? No, these are not okay, scales so that I use. so you don't used. know what it means? I, I know what it means, but this is not, I didn't use it in my I asked you what it means. I believe it means aggression. Yes, it does mean aggression. So, and when we look at aggression on this scale, it is a T-score of 38, right? That's correct. And so it is graphed far below the clinical significance scale, right? It's below clinical significance. And it's below even normal. Yes. So when we look at these scales on the MMPI, what we're looking at is the fact that uh, we've seen a high level of anxiety, right? Yes. And we've seen uh, high levels of depression. Yes. And we've seen low self-esteem. Yes. And these are all a symptomatic of PTSD, aren't they? Those are some symptoms seen in PTSD amongst other disorders, yes. So you see these symptoms in PTSD, don't you? You can, yes. You do, don't you? You can. So somebody with PTSD might not have these? Correct, like depression, for example. But they're going to have anxiety, aren't they? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so let's be specific. These, sure. You see these things most often uh, when you have a PTSD patient, you tend to see these things, don't you? No, not all of them. You don't see them. So no. you're telling me when you, don't have a, when you have a PTSD patient, you don't see anxiety? Anxiety, yes. All right, and so they're not always depressed? That's correct. Okay, and they don't always have low self-esteem? That's correct. According to you, right? According to me. That's, those right. are my patients that I've seen. And meanwhile, on the other hand, when we look at Jody's MMPI scores that you did, we see yeah. that there's, uh, we don't see any hostility on the scales, right? The over-controlled hostility, that was low, wasn't it? Can I interpret what that means? No, I'm asking you that you saw it on the scale and You're it was low, right? You're misinterpreting it, yes. And we saw that there was, it was also low on aggression, right? Which scale? On the last one that we just looked at. The ones that I don't interpret. I can't give an interpretation on that. The ones that you don't know about, is that what you mean? No, the ones that are empirically validated enough to use. Okay, so the ones that you choose not to use, right? That's standard. You're, you're aware that other psychologists use these scales, right? Most psychologists follow the standard that I do. It's common practice. Okay, you think most psychologists don't use these scales. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Nevertheless, just humor me for a second. You saw aggression, right? And you saw that it was below the clinical significance, right? I did see that. And you also saw that dominance was also below the clinical scale. I did. And below normal. Right? Yes. And having low hostility, low aggression, and no dominance, those are also characteristics of a battered woman, aren't they? Not necessarily. So in your experience, you don't see that in battered women? Not necessarily. Uh, and you, in your experience with trauma, you see these in trauma, don't you? What, what aspects specifically? Trauma victims? What aspects specifically? Having low hostility and low aggression? Have I seen that in trauma victims? Yes. I've seen it in some and not in others. And you've seen that these are also characteristics of PTSD, right? Sometimes it can be, yes. Again, sometimes. So these characteristics you have seen in your practice associated with PTSD, is that right? Which ones in particular? You just listed the off The same several. ones that I'm talking about. No hostility, no aggression, no dominance. Do I see that in trauma victims? No, PTSD I'm talking in about. In PTSD. Yes. Do I see no aggression in PTSD? Do you tend to see people with low aggression? You're talking about the characteristics that are, are not directly associated with the disorder. You're going back to differences in people. Everybody is different. One person with PTSD may look different than someone else with PTSD. Well, if everybody's different, then why would we bother using any of these scales at all? Because those aren't specific to PTSD. The MMPI is specific to personality characteristics in general psychopathology, not right. specific to PTSD. So when we're looking at personality, when we're looking at personality concepts of personality, what we just went through is the fact that Jody's concepts of personality, we see a low over, um, we, le we see low hostility, don't we? On these scales that you administered. Yes. And we see low dominance, right? Yes. And low dominance means passiveness, doesn't it? <laughs> I would have to look at exactly how the MMPI defines it. Would you like me to do that? No. Dominance. Dominance means that you dominate over somebody. Can you agree with that? 
Yes. Okay. And when you are not dominant, the opposite is passive, right? You're again making the assumption that the name of the scale is exactly what it measures, and that's not always the case on the MMPI. And you don't know, right? Is I'd be happy to look at it. She didn't elevate on that scale. She did not. Right, so that's not something that I interpreted. Right, so in other words, you only looked at her elevated scales. That's what's clinically significant, yes. Okay, so the fact that she was not elevated in things like aggression and dominance and hostility, that was not important to you. Research doesn't support low elevations. I'm asking you a question, Dr. DeMarte. I just want you to answer the question. Okay, can you ask that again, please? Yes. The fact that she was low in hostility, low in aggression, and low in dominance, that was not important to you. Is that what you're saying? You didn't interpret it, right? I did not interpret it. Okay. Thank you. Nothing further. Redirect. Ma'am, one of the things that, uh, ma'am, one of the things that you were asked about was this issue about feeling compassion. Do you remember being asked about that? Yes. And do you remember being asked about whether or not, when you conducted these evaluations involving kids and women, whether or not you felt compassion? Do you remember that? Yes. And do you remember what your answer was as to whether or not you did feel compassion? I said that I can feel compassion, but I don't walk in feeling compassion. And as a result of this compassion that you may feel involving kids, did you bring them lollipops and presents? No. Why not? You felt compassion. That crosses the ethical guidelines. What it's inappropriate. What does that mean? It violates the ethical guidelines. It means that that would make me engaging in inappropriate ethical behavior, and that's not something that I want to do. What about when you walk into these evaluations and you feel this compassion? Do you apologize to the individual when you walk in? The uh, the answer. Do you? I do not. Why not? Don't you feel compassion? Not when I walk in. I understand that when you walk in, but why don't you apologize anyway? It's part of the protocol of what we typically do when we do these evaluations. You just don't walk in and apologize. It would well, make me biased. And with regard to apologizing, giving gifts and this sort of thing, is that, is that indicative of any bias to you? Yeah. Is it? Yes. And what does bias do when you become involved in this kind of situation where you're evaluating somebody? It causes you to start just looking for variables that are supportive of whatever that bias is. What do you mean variables that are supportive of whatever that bias means? That's you up here. What are you talking about? You start to filter out information that may suggest something otherwise against your bias. So does that mean that you could skew a result? Yes. Now, the other thing that you were asked about was this email involving Travis Alexander and Sky Hughes. Do you remember that? Yes. And do you remember being asked about that email, whether or not Mr. Alexander had some positive things to say about um, the defendant? Do you remember that? Yes. Let's take a look at the, those emails. Now, you were asked about this and uh, something about the comment that they don't get any more honest than Jody. Do you remember something like that? Yes. With regard to this particular email, take a look at it. It's 589. What date are we talking about? This was January 29th of 2007. Do you know that they actually became an item in... By an item, boyfriend and girlfriend in February of 2007? I am aware of that. So what does that tell you that he is saying that before they became boyfriend and girlfriend? It's telling me that he had fond feelings of her prior to uh, them deciding to make become an official couple. At that time, do you know whether or not they said they had the same history that they had back in uh, May of 2008 when these words were being thrown around? No. So presumably, do you have any indication that these words that we've been talking about 
occurred before January of 2007? No. And how about these other indications that we have that you've talked about getting into the Facebook account, the email account? Do you have any indication that that had happened before January of 2007? That she went into his Facebook account? Not before that time. And you were also asked about this uh, indication from Mr. Alexander about him being extremely frightened because of the defendant's stalking behavior. Do you remember that? Yes. And you were asked, well, did you look for any other points that, that would support that? Do you remember being asked that before lunch? Yes. And do you remember that we stopped, but are there other points that corroborated that statement? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. May we approach? You may.
Ma'am, one of the things that you were asked about on direct examination in, with regard to this issue of stalking, you were asked whether or not these scales indicated or were titled aggression. Do you remember that? You were asked questions on the, about the MMPI involving the aggression and whether or not it was elevated, right? Correct. And you were in, in it, you indicated, and many questions were asked, well, isn't it before, below the threshold? Do you remember being asked about that, right? Yes. With regard to this issue of aggression as it applies to the stalking behavior, did you see, for example, involving the defendant, any indication from any other points involving stalking where there was some aggressive behavior? You're speaking outside of the MMPI? Outside of the MMPI, correct. Well, there was an... Go ahead. Go ahead. In terms of the stalking behavior, there was indication that she had gone into his Facebook account numerous... Objection, judgment, the scope, this is regard to aggression only. Sustained. Any indications, for example, that she did anything aggressive as part of this stalking behavior that she may have engaged in? In terms of... I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit confused with the line of question. Pardon? I'm getting a little bit confused with the line of questioning. You indicated with regard to the, MM, the MMPI in response to question that there was this aggressive behavior yes. uh, scale. Do you remember that? Yes. And that that was low in aggression, right? Yes. With regard to any aggressive behavior as it applies to stalking, did you see any behavior that you would characterize as aggressive that involved also stalking? Did you see any of that? I would characterize what I just highlighted, that going into someone's account several times without their permission would be intrusive and aggressive. So that's one. Anything else? Yes. Uh, theft, stealing um, his ring. Uh, the evidence. Sustained. With re anything else with regard to, well, Judge, may we approach on that? Okay. And with regard to the ring issue, is it true, yes or no, that the defendant took Mr. Alexander's ring, yes or no? Yes. What other indications did you see with regard to aggressive behavior on the part of the defendant as they apply or indicate to you that there's also a component of stalking associated with them? There was an indication that some emails were deleted. Judge, the world. And there, who deleted these emails? It was Miss Arias was accused of doing that. Okay. okay.
And in terms of the source of the deleted emails, what was the source of the deleted emails? It was in written communication. Between whom? With Miss Arias. And uh, I know, but Miss Arias was <coughs> involved in communication with somebody, right? Mr. Alexander. And that's the conversations that they had back and forth be between each other, correct? Yes. And we've talked about, for example, text messages that were involved. They were also between Mr. Alexander and Miss Arias, correct? Yes. Is there any reason to believe, for example, that if you have this exhibit, this is page 445, where they're talking about It's always something, Jody, it just gets old. Is there any reason to believe that this one is more true than the one involving the emails? No, they're all written communication. And it's written communication between the two of them, correct? Yes. You were asked about, well, this issue about whether or not you were an expert and the licensing that's involved. And the questions, question yesterday and today involved the definition of expert. What is your definition? And yesterday you did indicate to the defense attorney that it depended on the definition, correct? Yes. So what is your definition of an expert? The definition I was going off of was in terms of licensure. As I indicated when the question was first asked, I indicated that I was an expert as a clinical psychologist because that's what my license is in. And with regard to the state of Arizona, does it offer any special licensing or any special certificates certificate designating anybody, for example, an expert in domestic violence? No. Do they have, for example, licensing or certificates involving uh, the area of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder? No. Do they, does the state of Arizona offer any special certificates with regard to anything other than being a clinical psychologist? Or psychologist, no. And in this particular case, does the state of Arizona grandfather people in, or does it allow people, for example, who have been practicing, let's say, 30, 35 years, to say, for example, I'm an expert in domestic violence because of the, of the years that I've been spending in that area? No, it just, again, depends on who's defining expert. And with regard to your experience, you've already discussed what mm -hmm. your experience is with regard to Domestic violence, right? Yes. And in this particular case, you you referenced a work, didn't you? What was the name of the book that you referenced? By Lenore Walker. If that's the only book you referenced yesterday, yes. isn't it? Yes. Uh, is there any other, other book that you referenced yesterday? No. And in that book, you indicated there was certain criteria, right? Yes. What year was that book published? It was 2009. And in that, there was some criteria there, correct? Yes. And is that criteria still valid today? Yes. And what was that criteria? The criteria was laid out for being able to identify someone who has battered women's syndrome. The first three criteria are associated with the three domains of PTSD, re-experiencing, avoidance, and high arousal. The other, and then there's three more criteria. Disturbed interpersonal relationships as a result of the batterer's power and control, sexual intimacy issues, and body image issues. Those are the six criteria. And there's six criteria for what? Battered women's syndrome. And in this case, do you have an opinion as to whether or not, given everything that you've reviewed, the defendant has battered women's syndrome? She does not meet that criteria. She does not have battered women's syndrome. Why doesn't she meet that criteria? There are numerous indicators that suggest that she does not fall into the criteria, um, such as I highlighted yesterday. Well, give me an, you, you talked about the six criteria. What, what, are, what are we talking about? We talked about the three related to PTSD, the tendency to re-experience the trauma, the tendency to avoid indications of the trauma. If there was any kind of avoidance, for example, we wouldn't see any writing in the journals, going to the memorial, uh, going to his house after the memorial, um, indications like that. And one of the things that you were asked about was the amount of money that you make in this particular case. Yes. Uh, are you in charity work? Is that, what, is that why you went to school to become a, a psychologist? No. And are you aware of anybody? Uh, for example, do you know whether or not uh, Dr. Samuels charged for his services? 
I'm assuming he did. And how about Alice LaViolette? Do you know whether or not she charged? Again, I'm assuming she did. Ma'am, there were also some questions that were asked about you with regard to your CV. Do you remember that? Yes. And you were asked, well, you didn't list every single thing that you'd done. For example, you didn't list uh, places uh, or speeches that you had given. Do you remember being asked about that? Yes. And you indicated that you didn't do that. Why don't you do that with regard to every single little speech that you give? Most of my time is compromised in seeing patients and doing evaluations, and I get called in to do things like that, and afterwards I rush to get to another appointment with a patient. And while I think those speaking engagements are important, I rarely use my CV for anything other than things like this, so it's not something that's salient to me and as important as treating my patients. And with regard, are you familiar with what is known as padding your CV? Do you know what that is? Yes. I mean, that's a term that you used yesterday. What did you mean by that? If I put down everything that I did, my CV would, would be really big. If I put down every single type of client I worked with, every diagnosis, every evaluation that I did, it would be a very large CV. And the I don't see a purpose in doing that. So I, what's wrong with a bit CD with, I don't know, 100 pages? I don't know who would be interested in reading it, and I also just simply don't have the time to do that. The other thing that you were asked about, ma'am, was this, uh, these tests that were administered. Do you remember that? Yes. What were the tests? And one of the tests that were, was administered was the TSI, and you were asked about that, right? Yes. Who administered the TSI? I did. And what was the reason that you administered the TSI? I initially decided to give the TSI because a previous evaluator named Dr. Karp had administered the TSI. And what does the TSI do? What is it? What is that test about? It's the trauma symptom inventory. It's a measure of exposure to trauma and just general emotional um, negative psychological experiences. We've seen some that have the bubble sheet, and we've seen some where you fill in kind of the blank. What kind of test is that? It's, a, it's the same thing. It's a self-report measure where the person speaks about their own experiences. So do you write something out, or do you fill in the bubble sheet? I give them the questions and the bubble sheet, and they complete it on their own. So there are, there are responses that they can pick from then, correct? Yes. How many questions are involved in that? On the TSI, there's 100. And... What did that tell you? Instead of looking at the graphs, what is it that that told you? There was a number of different elevations on that test that was consistent with what Dr. Cart found. Uh, when you see a number of elevations like that, I went back and I specifically um, asked her where these kind of symptoms came from. Because remember, post-traumatic stress disorder is associated with specific trauma. I followed up with that. There seemed to be a number of different factors that contributed to these elevations. So and, let me stop you there. You said there was elevations. Elevations in what areas? That seems like we're talking for, up, hold on, in the sky. I want to know in what areas they were elevated. For example, depression, anxiety, uh, intrusive thoughts, identity. And so if you have elevations in those areas, what are they related to? Wouldn't that be important to know what these elevations are related to? Yes. And what, in terms of her responses, are they related to? Or did she indicate they were related to? To a number of different factors throughout her life, such as, such as intrusive experiences, or excuse me, intrusive thoughts. She said that she had thoughts about her childhood, about positive memories, negative memories, a number of different factors. What else? I mean, you listed four factors, and then you're just giving us one or two indications of that. If you, why don't you go ahead and give us the four factors that were elevated? Again. Well, there were several factors that were elevated. All right, give us the ones that were elevated. May I reference my sure, answer? Sure, go ahead. I've already highlighted anxiety and depression. Excuse me? I've already highlighted the anxiety and depression. All right, if, uh, let me stop you there with regard to the anxiety. So they're elevated, that really doesn't seem to say anything other than, for example, depression. She's in jail. Wouldn't you expect somebody that's in jail to have that elevated? Yes or no? Yes. Objection to characterize the TSI. And foundation, there are two TSIs.
you were asked about the TSI, correct? Correct. How many periods did the TSI look at? When I administered it? Yes. I administered it twice. Right, but which periods is what I'm asking. One was from January of 2007 to January of 2008. The other was within the last six months. All right, how about the one that went from January 7, 2007 to January 7th of 2008? Drawing your attention to that one, was there an elevation on the anxiety scale? Yes. And what in her answers supported this elevated anxiety? Her item response. Pardon? Her item response. There's a number of different items that would cause that scale to be elevated. And can you be specific about what it was that she said that she had this anxiety about? I don't have specifics of that. Okay. How about this depression? Do we know what she was depressed about? She, that... she indicated that it was related to a number of different factors. Such as what? Uh, one of the things that she highlighted was that she had thoughts um, about her relationship with Mr. Wattis. And... Those elevated scales on the TSI at the time period that you were asked about, how are they related to whether or not that is PTSD or borderline personality disorder? Does that help you or not help you? Well, an elevation in all those different scales, it could be indicative of PTSD, and it also could be indicative of, of borderline personality disorder. The way that I was able to differentiate it was by going back and asking follow-up questions about what were the exact traumas that then led to an elevation of these scales. And as I highlighted, there's a number of different areas. And furthermore, when you see elevations, um, several elevations on the TSI, it's also indicative of people with borderline personality disorder. You, you said there was a number of areas that she indicated, that she highlighted for you, that you talked to her about. What are those areas? The areas are the scales. Or the scale, no, you said, well, you went back and you clarified yes. and you talked to her and she indicated there were a number of areas. What areas are we talking about? We talked about um, stress related to being incarcerated, uh, thoughts about uh, the crime, thoughts about her frustration with the process of um, working with her family and with her attorneys in preparing for the process of trial. There was a number of different stressors that she highlighted. Yes. And with regard to the test involving the first area, okay. involving the elevated scales on the first test for the first period, okay, and whether or not that gave you an indication as to whether or not it was PTSD or borderline personality disorder, were there any indications there that it could be either, both, or neither? The high elevations indicated that it could be borderline personality disorder. And why is that as opposed to post-traumatic stress disorder? For the exact reasons that I just highlighted. That I understand that they were the exact reasons you just highlighted, but if you could just sure. tell me what the reasons are. There was a lot of distress around her sexual intimacy with Mr. Alexander. Two of the scales on the TSI are related to, to sexual, uh, being sexually content, feeling sexually comfortable. Um, she had indicated to me that that caused significant distress because it was against what she believed to be appropriate um, with the religion of being Mormon. And so you've told us all of that, but how does that tell us that that's, or tell you, that that's borderline personality disorder as opposed to post-traumatic stress disorder. What this suggests to me is, since there's a number of different areas that are elevated, is that there's general emotional distress there. And that's commonly seen in the literature that if you have high elevations across all the scales, that that's commonly seen in individuals with borderline personality disorder. You were also asked about the 
MCMI. Do you remember being asked questions about that? Yes. With regard to the MCMI, how many questions is that? Do you know? I believe it's 175. And with regard to this particular test, who is it normed against? A clinical population. What does that mean that it is normed against a clinical population? What is it that the test is looking at when you say it's normed against a clinical population? Anytime you take a test, we have to make a decision of what the test means. So we have to compare the test taker scores to something else. A clinical population would mean that we were comparing Ms. Arias' scores to individuals who already had been engaged in treatment, whether it be inpatient treatment like hospitalization or outpatient treatment, um, such as seeing a therapist weekly. And so how does that affect whether or not one makes a decision as to whether or not it's PTSD or borderline personality disorder? Well, in terms of the test, the sensitivity is just, it's lowered because you're comparing patient against potentially patient rather than what is a deviation from a normative sample, a typical person. That helps us decide whether there is a presence of a psychological diagnosis or not. Did that assist you in any way in making a determination as to whether or not it was PTSD or borderline personality disorder? Both of those fell below the threshold. So... And looking at that, any indications in your mind as to it was suggestive of either borderline personality disorder or something else? No, it was in supportive of either. And with regard to uh, Dr. Samuels, you read his report, right? Yes. Were there any indications about whether or not, after administering these tests, whether or not he had an opinion as to whether or not a personality disorder may be involved in this diagnosis of the defendant? Yes, in his report, he indicated that on axis two, which again is the area that we put personality disorders, he indicated that, um, that she had personality disorder, what's called NOS, not otherwise specified. So what does that mean in terms of uh, its connection with borderline personality disorder? Well, it suggests that there is the presence of problematic personality traits. Personality disorder, NOS, is what we consider the junk kind of um, category in that the person is displaying signs of a personality disorder, but just happens to not fit nicely into one specific disorder. And that was according to this test. So according to which test? The MCMI? That That's right? how it was listed in his report, yes. In, in his report, to him, there was an indication that there was this personality disorder not otherwise specified, correct? Yes. The other issue with regard to the testing, you were asked about the PDS. Do you remember that? Yes. And you were asked about the writings on the PDS, about the trauma that was suffered or that was indicated in one of the questions after question number 14. Do you remember that? Yes. And she answered, according to what you indicated to us, that the trauma that was associated with this test involved um, trauma by or, or, or a, a, an event involving two individuals, correct? Yeah. Objection to the, uh, uh, mischaracterizes the evidence. Correct? Yes. And you previously indicated that, in your belief, that was untruthful, correct? Yes. And based on the fact that that was untruthful, if that was an untruth, what would it do to the rest of the responses involving the PDS? It completely invalidates it. Why? Why would it invalidate the PDS? Because on the PDS, all the subsequent symptoms are associated with the trauma that was highlighted earlier in the questionnaire. She highlighted earlier in the questionnaire that the trauma was related to people, I think it was labeled non-stranger, or stranger, excuse me. And so she indicated that that was the trauma that she was focusing on when filling out the subsequent questions. So what does that do to the validity of her responses involving the PDS? It's completely invalid. And is that something that can be used to support the finding that she is somebody who can be diagnosed with PTSD? It can't be used for anything. Why can't it be used for anything? It's a completely invalid test. She lied on it. Objection. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. And all the subsequent questions were based on something that didn't exist. You were also asked today about the MMPI. Do you remember being asked about that? Yes. 
And you were being asked about a number of scales and you indicated that, well, some of them you used and some of them you didn't use. The ones that you didn't use, first, given, you indicated there was two of them that you didn't use, correct? Two larger categories, yes. Right. What was the first category? Of the ones that I didn't use? That is correct. I believe they're called the restructured scales. And with regard to the restructured scales, why didn't you use them? They were there, right? They were. Why didn't you use them? I've never used them. It's typical practice to not use it. I'm sure there's some psychologists out there that may use it. It just doesn't have as much empirical support as all the other scales were, and it's important to me to be as accurate as possible, so I want to use the measures that have the most empirical support. When you talk about empirical support, what are you talking about? Research backing. So they're included, but in your experience, they don't have enough research backing. What does that mean? It means that there, it, there's potential for them not to be as accurate. So I don't want to rely on something that's not as accurate. What about the other scales or the other structures that you didn't use? I don't recall even the name of them. I don't use them. And would you, with regard to the ones that you did use, why did you use those? That's what's commonly done in practice. Those are the three primary um, scale scores that are used. And Something that may be commonly used in practice, that may be so, but couldn't that be wrong? In other words, how is, why is it that you're relying on something that's commonly used? Have you done any, have you received any, any education that indicates to you that those are the ones to use? Consistently, this is what most psychologists use. And in my educational experience, that's what we're trained to do. And so you looked at those and you saw that some of the, uh, the uh, peaks and the valleys that are involved in there seem to suggest that there wasn't any borderline personality disorder there, correct? No. Or did it suggest to you or indicate to you that there was borderline personality disorder? Those scales do suggest that there's a presence of person borderline personality disorder. Tell me about that. Why do you say that? Sure. So when you talked about the lows on them, on the MMPI, you don't interpret things below the threshold. You interpret above. There's very few scores or scales that you actually interpret below. Um, in terms of the peaks, as I highlighted earlier, when you see that many that are elevated above 65, that's very meaningful. That indicates that there's this emotional turmoil that's consistent with borderline personality disorder. Why isn't it post-traumatic stress disorder and instead of borderline personality? Well, one of the features that was highlighted earlier, one of the scales was post-traumatic stress disorder that was elevated. An important part of that scale is that, again, it doesn't link it back to a specific trauma. The interpretation of that is that there is a lot of emo um, negative emotional turmoil. There's a feeling of feeling like you're out of control. That's the interpretation of the post-traumatic stress disorder scale. And you were asked about a instant messaging or message that was... Uh, on May 26th of 2008. Do you remember being asked about that? Yes. And you indicated, well, there is some in inappropriate language there, correct? Yes. And you also indicated that even though there is a pattern inside of this particular message, you indicated that you didn't see a pattern throughout. What were you talking about? I reviewed a lot of uh, written exchanges between Mr. Alexander and Ms. Arias. There were certainly times where Mr. Alexander used unhealthy language, as highlighted before. This was something that happened infrequently and typically happened in times when he was upset about... It was in times where he felt lied to, betrayed, or... You indicated that at times Mr. Alexander said, felt lied to. Can you give us the specific example where he felt like that uh, he was lied to? There were numerous 
there were several um, communications, between, written communications between the two of them where he indicated that she was lying about something, that he wrote and called her a liar for engaging in various behaviors. And so when you say that, does that indicate to you that there isn't a pattern with regard to this name calling or use of inappropriate language? The only pattern that was there was that it, he tended to respond in that manner in times when his privacy was invaded, when he felt like she was being untruthful with him. When she felt like he wasn't, when he felt like she wasn't being truthful, he reacted in that way. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, they had a lot of communication with each other, a lot of text messages, a lot of um, IMs, a lot of emails. There was no indication that he used this kind of verbiage on a regular basis outside of these situations. Uh, you were also shown Exhibit 511. And there's an indication that... Um, and you were asked about, but it still remains that I can't, I cannot marry him. I can't quite put my finger on it, but something is just off with that boy. Well, all, we all got head problems, that's for sure, right? Yes. It says that. But there are certain things that will never sit right with me. And it says about, doesn't it? Yes. But there's more to it than that, right? It talks about, about him, right? And then it gives the examples of what she says is wrong with him, right? Yes. Oh, really? And if you can read it, not I'll have to give it to you. What does it say? For example, he always makes that ridiculous joke. Families can be forever. Why do you want to spend so much time with them now? Can you pull it back so that I could read it all at once? There you go. Can you read it now? I can't read what that word says. I... How about I and then abhor? Can you see that? Abhor that. I want, I want a family man. A man Go ahead. Going, a man who takes family seriously. I know he jokes, but that drives me crazy, and it's a big turnoff. But he has told me time, time again that, it, that if I... He, if he could that marry... That if he could marry me, it would mean he won the wife lottery. That's sweet, actually. And so... When you are just shown portions of this particular item, it seems to indicate that she's saying there's something wrong with him, right? Yes. But then it, she also explains it. You were asked whether or not it was borderline personality disorder or whether or not it was PTSD. Yes. And we previously talked about it. So this is what, we pre, what was discussed. You indicated that one of the first, or the first item involving borderline personality disorder was it effort to avoid real or imagined abandonment. And you were asked about that. Does she meet that criteria, yes or no? Yes. Give me the examples that you believe show that she meets that criteria of borderline personality disorder instead of post-traumatic stress disorder. She had a strong desire to maintain relationships. She would engage in behaviors that, again, to an outsider may be questionable as to how this would keep someone from abandoning them. For example, she was found hiding behind a Christmas tree. She would... Sh not scope and, and mischaracterize as not, not in evidence. Approach, please.
You were talking to us about an indication about her being near or a Christmas tree. Tell me about that. That she was find, found hiding behind a Christmas tree. Whose Christmas tree? At Mr. Alexander's house. All right. Any other examples of these efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment? She would show up unannounced, <coughs> repeatedly. Would that create problems between her and Mr. Alexander? Yes. Anything else? There were... As it applies to... Oh, to this efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment. There's indications that this occurred in previous relationships also. And for example, what are you talking about? For example, her relationship with Matt McCartney. Yes. She, uh, there was indication in the records that he tried to end the relationship uh, before she was willing to allow that to happen. In fact, he was had already moved on, was dating someone else who she later confronted. Girl. Now, ma'am, there's also number two, unstable and in intense interpersonal relationship. Again, briefly tell us what that is and the elements or the aspects of the defendant's behavior that qualify her for this borderline personality disorder symptom. It's a tendency to have disrupted interpersonal relationships due to the tendency to either idealize someone or devalue them and have a tendency to switch between the two. Let me ask you uh, with regard to Exhibit 511. In the first part of it, she's talking about there's something wrong with that boy. Do you see that? Yes. Then in the second portion about that, she talks about, I want to be married, and then says, Travis is awesome, no doubt. And she says um, something about that. Is that the kind of thing that you are talking about where he's, she says something good and then says something bad? Or are we mis or am I not giving you the accurate? Yeah, uh, I wouldn't use that as an example. I, I, let me provide a, a better example of it. Go ahead. Um, for example, after the memorial service, the records indicated that on the plane ride home, Miss Arias exchanged phone numbers with another male, who she then called right when she came home after Mr. Alexander's memorial service. That would be an example um, to show that at that point there was a devaluing, a despising, that someone who had just lost someone who was very close with that, to them was able to engage in a courting behavior like that right after the memorial service. Behavior. Overruled. How about identity disturbance? What do you, well, again, briefly, what is that and how does the defendant manifest the symptom? I've talked a lot about identity disturbance, not having a strong core sense of who you are. Um, there's indication that that has been present uh, throughout her adolescence and throughout adulthood. An example that I found in the records was her tendency to change herself, to uh, fit into different environments, her tendency to change the way she looked because she thought that an ex-boyfriend would prefer that, such as getting implants and changing the color of her hair. Does the fact that she became a member of the LDS faith after two months, is that indicative of an identity ish, disturbance issue or not? It's another data point that suggests that she very quickly changed her religious views and intensely became involved with the Mormon short, church shortly after becoming a member. Suicidal behavior and ideation. There was this talk about threats and that sort of thing. Um, Explain that to us as it applies to the issue of threat or non-threat. Having suicidal ideation is thinking about it, thinking about what it would be like, talking about it. That's different from a threat, which is, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to grab, uh, I'm going to take some pills and I'm going to kill myself. Does the, that prong or that aspect of the diagnosis require an actual planning or an actual threat or does it require something else? No, it doesn't require an actual threat. We're just looking at ideation. Is this person frequently thinking about harming themselves? And was she frequently thinking about suicide? Yes, it was, there was notations of that throughout the records. How about affective instability? Again, the, the records were re replete with comments about her tendency to go up and down very quickly. Uh, emotional ability, as a reminder, is that emotional roller coaster that I talked about before. Quick changing emotions based on environmental stressors. So, for example, someone 
dropping their keys on the floor instead of getting a little bit upset about it, getting really emotionally upset about it, that quick change in emotions. All right. Well, how did the defendant manifest that? All of her romantic partners um, indicated that they saw this in her, that this was a common thing. A tendency to be dramatic was an adjective that was frequently used in describing her. Um, you could see it in her journal entries that went from happy to sad very quickly. Feelings of emptiness. How does she manifest that? Again, I specifically asked her about this idea of feeling empty. She indicated that this has been a characteristic that has been stable throughout her life, just feeling like there's nothing there, this tendency of feeling completely empty inside. And there's inappropriate, intense anger. What is that? Just as it indicates that there's this tendency to feel really angry and upset. Is this related to the something like the February 14th, 2007 uh, email where she talked about the destruction involving the door, the window, that sort of thing, or is this something different? It was something like that, and also there was indication in, in her journal where she indicated that she just has so much hate inside of her. Well, didn't we also see some uh, scales that indicated that the anger was low? Do you remember seeing those? Yes. And which test was that? That was on the MMPI. And doesn't that speak against what you have there? What I was trying to explain before is that the name of the actual scale doesn't always go along with the interpretation. As I described before with PTSD, there's other scales on the MMPI that indicate, that have a component of aggressiveness and anger in them. And there are two of those scales that she elevated on. Foundation. So ma'am, how does that, again, how do you reconcile this intense anger versus what you saw? On the MMPI? Yes. That there is some indication that she has some anger problems, that she had some feel, strong feelings of anger internally. And again, with... Re which scales? Sustained. Which scales are we talking about? May I reference my Sure. Notes? Supplementary elevations, I mean the supplementary scales, excuse me. There's a component within the addiction admission scale and addiction potential scale. And now that we have the scales, how do the numbers or the elevations in those scales, how do they, if you will, correspond or not correspond with this inappropriate intense anger that uh, is indicated in somebody that has borderline personality disorder? They suggest that there is some evidence of aggressiveness and anger inside, internal anger. Um, this May 26, 2008 email that was referred where the uh, victim, where Mr. Alexander does use some words that you uh, classified as inappropriate, correct? Yes. And um, you also talked about a pattern of, be not behavior, but a pattern in these particular items uh, as it involves the interaction between the defendant and Mr. Alexander, correct? Yes. And in this particular item, can you walk us through it, showing us what the defendant did or said as part of this and how Mr. Alexander responded involving these words? Sure, may I have the... Sure, take a look at it. Read it and then let me know when you're done reading it.
Are you done reviewing it? Yes. Walk me through it. This is another situation where he was upset about her invading his privacy. And as a result of that, did the conversation continue? Yes. And when he first started this conversation, did he use this language that has been posed to you um, about the, wor the words or that sort of thing? He was very stern at the, be at the beginning. He yeah. But was he using those words in the beginning? Not at the beginning. And then what happened after the conversation continued? He, it, it escalated. He asked her to be truthful. And um, was she truthful about it? Right. In the view of this May 26, 2008 document, in his view, as he continued to escalate, did he believe she was being truthful? No. no. And so what happened then? They continued to argue and talk about it. Did he make disparaging remarks about himself? <laughs> Such as being nothing more than a dildo with a heartbeat? Yes. Did he also make disparaging comments about her? Yes. And then did it escalate to some of these names that were being called? Yes. And is that character assassination? Using those words to impact your character, it could be considered that, yes. But just because they are character assassination, does that mean that there's a pattern that they have dealing with each other in this way? Or is it just a pattern in this, in this particular argument or the arguments that they had? Related to those incidents where they had these exchanges. And is this a pattern of abuse involving all of these conversations? Or is that just a pattern inside of this particular uh, conversation? It was Oh, really? It was a pattern within those conversations, not across time. And it, other than the, sta the defendant's statements about the physical, um, according to her, those four physical um, issues of violence, were there any other issues that she described of violence other than the four to you? No. And also you were able to review the instant messages and the text messages were you? Yes. And as a result of that, do you have an opinion as to whether or not she was the victim of abuse? Objection to the scope. Approach, please. Based on these conversations and the conversations with the defendant, was she the victim of, of abuse? There was not a pattern that suggested that she was a victim of abuse. So your answer is no. Right. I don't have anything else. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a 10-minute recess. If you have any questions for this witness, please leave them in the basket. Please remember the admonition. You are excused. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Dr. DeMarte, the jurors have some questions for you. I'm going to ask 
these questions in the order in which they were submitted. How many forensic cases have you worked on? I've been doing forensic cases for several years. If we're talking about cases that are specifically where an attorney has hired me or the court has hired me, I've been doing that since 2010 when I became licensed. I've been doing other forensically related work um, beginning in 2007. How many times have you testified based on your evaluations? While I've done several forensic evaluations, I've only been asked to testify three times. This is my third time. How many cases involved abuse? Are you, if this is specific to forensic cases or in general, several of my general evaluations, it's commonly the case that abuse is involved, whether it's child abuse, sexual abuse, or domestic violence. If it's related to forensic cases, I'll need a second to think. Hypothetically, if a person suffered PTSD because of a bear attack while hiking, would you throw out their PDS test if they lied and said it was a tiger? Yes, those would be different events. Uh, a lot of times what you see um, with PTSD is that there's different triggering events that remind them of the trauma. So I would expect that a bear and a tiger would look different, smell different, act different, and the subsequent symptoms would be associated with those variables, with those differences among them. So I would say that they were different and that I would. Would the person be answering the question the same regardless of whether they call the animal a bear or a tiger? Can you ask that again? Would the person be answering the questions on the PDS the same regardless of whether they call the animal a bear or a tiger? They would be answering it very different. <clears throat> Do you believe absolutely that it is possible to remain purely unbiased in an evaluation once compassion creeps in. I do think it's possible to remain unbiased if you have some compassion. And there are indicators that we have to look within ourselves and barriers that we have to have in front of us to suggest whether we're crossing the line. So crossing the line could be giving something to someone or maybe even being triggered by overruled. Maybe even being triggered by our own traumas, our own life experiences that could make us feel bi biased. So I think it's very possible to have compassion um, and not be biased, but we have to make sure that we as professionals are really paying attention and watching that line. What types of people are at risk for developing or having borderline personality disorder? Unfortunately, anyone's at risk, but what we see is a higher prevalence rate of borderline personality disorder in individuals who have been exposed to trauma and neglect throughout their lifetime. One of the important variables that's often talked about in the literature is this idea of being invalidated by family members and by parents. What invalidation means is if the person says, for example, let's say a child is riding their bike and they fall and they hurt their knee and they're crying because their knee hurts. An example of an invalidation would be a parent saying, your knee doesn't hurt, you're fine. They're invalidating their emotions, they're invalidating their experiences. When we see that happening frequently throughout their childhood, that tends to increase the chances that they'll develop uh, borderline personality disorder. In the interview Jody gave where she stated, mark my words, no jury will ever convict me, do you feel that is part of a borderline personality di personality disorder, especially since she is smiling when she said it? I think that's another example um, of self-esteem. And it's also an example of that immaturity that I talked about before, making these uh, immature statements. Yeah. Overruled. These immature statements that are often seen in people with borderline personality disorder, I do think that that's consistent. Wouldn't taking the camera, rather than leaving it, show more organizational thinking capabilities? I would say that they're both an example of organization, just different type of organization, with the goal being hide the evidence, take away information associated with the killing. 
When asked by defense about efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment, you stated you had other examples for this category that did not involve Travis. Can you share those examples? Yes. Throughout her diary, she used that word exa exactly, fear of abandonment. Oh, I take that back. Abandonment. I feel abandoned. She made that comment at least a couple times with other boyfriends. There was also indication in those relationships that they had cheated on her and that she continued to stay in that relationship and then subsequently befriend them and become very close to them despite being treated in that kind of way. Those were some of the examples that were found in other relationships. Do you think deleting pictures from a camera and then washing that camera is an attempt to remove or destroy evidence? That's the impression that it gives, yes. If you had not seen pictures proving that the evidence, photos, was recovered, given your knowledge of cameras, would you have viewed this as an effective attempt to destroy evidence? Can you ask that again, please? If you had not seen pictures proving that the evidence, photos, was recovered, given your knowledge of cameras, would you have viewed this as an effective attempt to destroy evidence? Of putting it, yes. My knowledge of cameras is that if you put it in water, that it would be destroyed and that we wouldn't expect the camera to continue to work and that the memory card would be destroyed. But again, my, my knowledge of cameras is probably that of the average person. In your opinion, is it normal for a person who is incarcerated to be depressed and have anxiety? Yes, I've worked with many individuals who are incarcerated. Interestingly, you, you don't consistently see it in all of them, but certainly it's not something that's outside of the scope of what we would expect to see in someone who has a, a significant change in environment, living you know, at home and then all of a sudden being controlled in a jail setting. It's a big difference, and I would expect to see some changes. Do you consider Jody stabbing, shooting, and slitting Travis's throat to be a traumatic event? That certainly is a, an event that could be considered traumatic. The variables that would be important to me to know is how she experienced the event. Would have to be on scope? Overruled. Overruled. You may continue. PTSD, traumatic events that are associated with PTSD, we look for the person's response to it. Did they experience horror? Did they experience fear associated with the event? If there was this association of being terrified, fear, horror as a result of the event, and there's evidence that there was this horror, fear that continued after the event, then yes, I would consider it as a potential for the development of PTSD. You said you administered the TSI to Jody because Dr. Karp had done the same, but you did not re-administer other tests that Dr. Karp or Dr. Samuels had given. Can you explain why? Yes. The test that I gave, uh, I gave four different tests. One was, again, just a measure to make sure that she had the right reading requisites uh, for the self-report measure. Overruled. The other tests, the WACE and the MMPI, those are tests that are, are very commonly used in forensic settings, and for good reason. They provide us a lot of really good and important information. So I decided to, I made the decision to use those tests because I thought it would be very helpful. In terms of why I didn't use the other tests, I felt like the, the tests that I gave answered the questions that I needed and that it wasn't necessary to administer those other tests. And I made the decision to administer the TSI because I did want to look at continuity across um, evaluators. Do you know what the differences are between the TSI-1 versus the TSI-2? There's slight differences in terms of scale scores. I have not used the TSI-2, so I'm not as familiar as I am with the TSI-1. And there's updated norms also. Regarding the PDS answer sheet, exhibit number 555, do you know whose handwriting is on the PDS answer sheet? Are we Mr. Martinez, do you have exhibit 555? Thank you.
Judge, may we approach? You may. Dr. DeMarte, you've been handed Exhibit 550. Do you know whose handwriting is on that answer sheet? I would have to make the assumption that this is... Objection. Sustained. Do you see any issues with Dr. Samuels filling out the answer sheet and possibly summarizing the written answers on Section 2? Of this... Yes, this, uh, this is often given to the person to fill out themselves. The, the only time that that can happen is if it's someone who doesn't have the mobility to be able to do it themselves or isn't able to see properly or there's some sort of impairment there that would prevent them from doing it. Um, so I do see it problematic that if Ms. Arias didn't fill this out, that she didn't. That just isn't in line with how it's typically administered and could potentially uh, be suggestive of something else. Does it cause any concern for you regarding the validity of the test that the written answers appear to be answered by someone who is familiar with psychological verbiage and not in layman's verbiage? Yes, that would be very concerning. Follow up, Mr. Martinez. I think you indicated previously something about waiting a minute to think about when you were being asked about your experience. Do you remember that? Yes. And have you had a moment to think about the question? Yes. And I believe the question was related to how many forensic evaluations. I'm going to have to give a general estimate. Again, I don't keep count of it. I'd say it's probably somewhere... Uh, if I'm using forensic evaluations as a general term, working with individuals who have been adjudicated or in the adjudication process, probably no more than 75, somewhere around there. No other questions. Come on. Um, talking about uh, uh, her feelings of abandonment and one of the reasons that you thought that she fulfills that criteria was because she stayed in a relationship where the man was cheating on her. That, that she would continue indication. to stay, right? Yes. And 
um, continuing to stay in a relationship where a man is, is um, cheating on you, that's also a sign of low self-esteem, isn't it? It could potentially. And you were asked the question about whether or not it's normal to see anxiety and depression in somebody who's uh, on a TSI, um, on a TSI trauma symptom inventory when the person's in custody. Do you remember that question? Is it normal to see anxiety and depression? I don't know that it was specific to the TSI. Was that the way it was posed? I think it was just the question was anxiety and depression. Okay, well, that, that's fine. Okay. You, is it normal? So you answered that it's normal to see anxiety and depression in somebody who is in custody, right? I said that I've seen it in some people and not in all, but it wouldn't be uncommon. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the, the trauma symptom inventory test that you gave to Miss Arias, you gave her two, right? Yes. And one of the ones that you gave her, you were interested in her answering those questions as how they related from her feelings between January 2007 to January 2008, right? Yes. So she was not in custody during that time, right? That's correct. In fact, that was the time that she was involved with Mr. Alexander. Yes. And on that trauma inventory test, that one also showed anxiety, high anxiety levels, right? High anxiety, yes. High depression levels. Yes. Okay. And you asked the question about uh, the differences between the TSI-1 and the TSI-2, right? Yes. Uh, and you, you answered that you have not even used the TSI-2, is that right? That's correct. And the TSI-2, that's been out and available for at least three years now, right? I'm not oh, sure. I'm sorry, two years. I'm not sure the exact time. Well, you gave the TSI-1 to Miss Arias, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And you did that in 2011? Yes. Is that right? Yes. So you gave that to her in 2011, but you were aware that the TSI-2 was available at that time, right? I wasn't aware at that time. I, I thought you knew that you just didn't have it because the people you worked for didn't purchase it yet. I learned about that afterwards. They were the ones that were in charge of purchasing the test. At that time, I didn't know that a new one had just been released. I had afterwards found out that one had just been released. Okay, so now you're telling me that you did know that a new one had been re re released in 2011. I don't know the date of when it was released. I knew it was released in 2011. I just said I don't know the date that it was released. I, I thought you just said that you found out later from it that the owners just of Bayless just chose not to buy the TSA, TSI-2 at the time that you gave it to Miss Arias, and that's why you didn't have it. I'd like to clarify. Isn't that what you just said? I'd like to clarify. Did you not say that? I, I'm getting a little confused by the verbiage that you're, the way you're phrasing your questions. Okay. All right. When you gave the TSI-1 to Miss Arias, yes. right? Okay, that was in 2011, correct? Yes. And when you gave that to her, you told us before that you did not use the TSI-2, right? Right. Okay, and you told us that you did not use the TSI-2 because your employer at the time did not get it yet. Is that correct? That they did not buy it, yes. Yes, okay. So that would stand to reason then that the TSI-2 was available in 2011. I believe it was. Okay. And so what you're telling us then today also then is that uh, since 2011, you haven't given the TSI-2 ever, right? No, I have. You've well, given I was, the TSI-2? Yes. No, no, I'm sorry. The TSI-1. Okay. Yes. All right. So you, I, you've never used the TSI-2? That is correct. Okay. So you've never used the updated test? Then. I have not used the updated test. Have you given the TSI-1 since 2011? Not recently, but yes, in 2011. Just in 2011? Uh, I've used it while I was at Bayless still, so I left there in August of 2012 and would use it. Okay, so you haven't used it since 2012 then? Yes, correct. Okay. And you were asked a question about handwriting on... I have oh, it. you have it? Yes, right? Yes. Okay. And if, if at the time the PDS test is given, uh, the person does not have the actual test booklet with them, answers can be written down on, on an extra sheet of paper, can't they? I wouldn't choose to do that. But they can, it can happen, right? Any, yeah, anybody can choose to do that. Okay, I'm showing you Exhibit 534. Do 
You see at the top here it says the name Jody Arias, right? I do. And then check marks, right? Yes. And then for question 13, you see it says item 12, right? Yes. And the writing is repeated emotional slash psychological abuse, right? Yes. And if this information is taken and copied exactly onto the PDS booklet, that wouldn't be a problem then, right? As long as it's the same information that's copied. If it was copied ac accurately. Okay. And can you see the difference in handwriting between where we see repeated emotional and psychological abuse and let's say circle numbers that apply? Can you see the difference in handwriting there? Yes, but I'm not a handwriting expert. I know, just in your opinion. Overruled. You said yes, but you're not an expert? I mean, the question is, do I see differences? In yeah, do you see a difference in handwriting where it says item 12, repeated emotional and psychological abuse, and then just a line down where it says circle numbers that apply? I could say it looks a little different. Just yes. a little, okay. I'd... I have nothing further. Thank you. Any other questions from the jury? All right, ladies and gentlemen, have any of you seen anything about this case in the media? Have you read anything? Heard anything? I see no hands. Has anyone attempted to talk with you about this case other than court staff and people associated with this trial? I see no hands. All right, no trial tomorrow, no trial on Monday, Tuesday, 9.30 a.m. Please remember the admonition. Are there any questions? Have a nice weekend. will show the jury has left the courtroom. Dr. DeMarte, did you have a question? I was just going to ask about my materials that were taken. All right. We will resolve that issue here shortly. Counsel, anything else? No, thank you. We are at recess.